a world where nostalgia rages across the land, where everyone and their mother has a podcast, where there's still a movie trailer guy who says, in a world, three friends revisit films, shows, and games that molded them as they search for answers to life, the universe, and everything in between. Settle in and join us for Screen Refresh. Welcome back to Screen Refresh, a show where we revisit the films, shows, and games that molded us as we search for the answers to life, the universe, and everything in between. I'm your host, Dean. I have a bit of a cold, so sorry for that if I sound stuffy. But in any case, I'm joined by the rest of the Screen Refresh crew, Nick, Tim, and David. Hi, guys. Hello there. Hi. Hi ho. What brings us together today is a little film released on June 11th of 1982. A guy you might have heard of, Steven Spielberg, had a vision. I, I don't know if it was his vision, honestly. I don't I don't know the story of this movie behind it. But uh <laughs> Do you imagine? I don't know the story of this movie. I didn't watch it. I'm just going by all of my core memories from childhood. 30 years ago. I googled a summary of the movie, and that's how I'm going to be guiding us today. Uh, <laughs> this one's the prequel to Alien, right? The, yes, the movie, that one. The movie is E.T., the extraterrestrial. And that's it. So it was his brainchild. Um, it was his brainchild? Okay. So he had the idea uh, for a film, I think it was called Night Skies, that was going to be more of a follow-up to Close Encounters of the Third Kind that was supposed to be more horror and then over time, working with the writer, Melissa Matheson, they kind of took all these bits and pieces out of, okay, well, maybe what if we just follow the one good alien from that? And then what if it's instead of like the terrorizing of the kids that they help out with, maybe it's they are only meeting him and it slowly morphed into what E.T. turned into. Yeah, Melissa Matheson is the writer on this. She also wrote, I didn't know this was an older movie, and I think I thought it was a different movie, but she wrote The Black Stallion, which was yeah. came out in 79. Wait, 79? Black Stallion really? was 79? Really? I thought it was like 92, unless they made a, like a remake. Oh, I'm thinking of Black Beauty. I'm also thinking of Black Beauty. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and I think that's why I thought of Black, that's why I was surprised. I don't know what the movie is, but it's... <laughs> Uh, I'm like, wait yeah. a second, I remember I remember <laughs> that being noting. posters when I was in theaters, I think, for like Lion King or something. <laughs> yeah, Kelly it's, Reno, Mickey Rooney, Terry Gar. It's a live action movie, not a not an animated it was yeah, the Black well, yeah, Beauty. Was that an Black, animated movie? No, Black no, Beauty was, was live action. Okay. Yeah, was, yeah, well this I don't know if it's a sequel to the Black Stallion. <laughs> in any case. She also wrote the Twilight Zone movie, the Indian in the Cupboard movie, Ponyo. The BFG, which I didn't see. I didn't see Ponyo or the BFG. Ponyo's good. I thought it was, I thought a, it was a bold choice because when I think BFG, I think of Doom, not yeah, whatever acronym not BFG a, means. Not the big friendly big, giant. Big fucking yeah, giant. Yeah, big friendly giant. <laughs> it's weird that we're talking about BFG because recently, like Instagram has been pushing all sorts of BFG clips at me, and I'm like, I don't even know what this is. <laughs> Wait, really? <laughs> the move from that movie? Yeah. I was like, it came up today. Like, I was, I was on uh, on Instagram looking at reels, and like, all of a sudden, there's this giant, and he's got like this green fizzy drink. But he hands the queen, and I'm like, what is this movie? <laughs> so, I, big friendly I giant. This is one of those like weird Russian fantasy movies that I always see clips of, and I'm like, oh, I need to see this. I'm pretty sure Big Friendly Giant or BFG was also Steven Spielberg, but it was yeah based on a children's book. I want to say it's a Roll Dahl book. Yes. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah, there's a couple Steven Spielberg collabor- collab- collaborators on this. Co-conspirators. Um, like his co-conspirators, like cinematographer Alan Davial. Davial? It just uh, rolls off the tongue. <laughs> Alan Davial, of course. He actually shot Spielberg's old short film Amblin, the one that got him like his, his deal. Oh, interesting. Yeah, but it's interestingly, I don't think he worked with him again until this movie. I could be wrong, but looking at his um, credits, I don't think I recognize any Spielberg movies between this and that. But he shot The Color Purple. He shot, not a Spielberg, but Harry and the Hendersons, Empire of the Sun, and Defending Your Life, the... um, Albert Brooks? Albert Brooks movie, yes. Thank you. 
<laughs> he did Van Helsing. <laughs> and Van Helsing, yes. That's, I wonder. That's true. So for Spielberg, was this the first time he did a film that was under the Amblin umbrella? Or was that already established for Amblin Pictures prior to this? I don't know, since this became like the logo for Amblin. That's a good that's a oh, good so yeah, that would probably question. mean this would be prior if this became the logo. For the, <laughs> that'd be bold if he was like Amblin Pictures and he uses a screenshot from this movie. <laughs> it's going to be big. I know it. The cast, Elliot played by, I think, first timer Henry Thomas, the star of the movie, little boy. Gertie, I think this, was this before fire uh, uh fire starter? was a fire starter yeah uh, i think this was the first one this was the first one yeah very more was her first um yeah and then fire starter came after i mean it's got to be right yeah cuz she's i mean she's i think it's probably pretty close to together in age uh, et first then fire starter 2 years later yeah she plays elliot's sister gertie His, elliot's brother mike is played by robert McNaughton. The mother, played by D. Wallace, Mary, and then his uh, Mike's school friends, Greg. I don't know these guys really if they did much else, but Casey Martell. Steve is played by Sean Fry, and of course Tyler C. Thomas Howell, who went on to have more starring roles in yeah. one career. Did something happened. Is he weird today? Did something happen with him? <laughs> <laughs> Should we be I've... less excited, more excited? Um... <laughs> I mean, it's it's it, true to the fact that it's like some of the I don't keep up on all of their lives. So sometimes you'd be like, it's so nice to always see this person. Then you Google and it's like arrested for killing four. Um, that yeah, may I, have so, like his his name triggers something in me. Like I read a blurb that he I don't know. Maybe not. I'm not. I don't mean to speak bad of him. Dressed as E.T. He wrong. holds a family hostage. <laughs> Oh, I want to fly again. And then the mysterious, for a while, Mr. Keys, as he's known, I think he's credited that way, played by Ke- Peter Coyote. I'm assuming it's Coyote because that's how it's written, and I don't know how else you'd pronounce it. Coyote. 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 <laughs> Coyote. <laughs> Coyote. The bus for the Coyote begins in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> It's his fighting name in the Kumite, Coyote. <laughs> but yes. Like, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, like, Henry Thomas. So, uh, like, for everybody else, this is the first time I've ever seen this movie. I had heard, like, I'd seen scenes, but it was just something that we owned and I just never watched growing up. I never went back to. So, this was a first time watch. Henry Thomas comes out of the gate swinging as Elliot in this movie. Like, Going back and watching his audition video, if anybody goes right. on like YouTube and searches like Henry Thomas audition for E.T., okay, kid, you got the job. Like, that's the video I watched. He's like going full force at this thing. And then you're watching the casting people in the room setting him up for him, his like him to read his lines. And it's you are giving this kid 10% and asking for 90 of their like, okay, um, you're going to be the little kid and we're going to pretend like maybe the president said he wants to take your alien. Elliot, we're coming to take your alien and I can do that because I'm the president. And then all of a sudden he'll hit like an Oscar caliber reaction to this. And then they go back and they're like, but, but I can do what I want because I'm the president, Elliot. And it's like, guys, it's amazing to me that this kid <laughs> even bothered to book you after this. <laughs> I I, I, wanna... I don't know a whole lot about the audition process. I imagine they that's part of the, you know, weeding out process. It's like if you can't just draw on something and like do it, then it's like, well, maybe you can't cut it. Yeah, I do wonder how many like initial casting meetings there are casting auditions are just like that and it's not until like further rounds that you actually get to bounce off someone who's already been cast yeah like re- yeah, reading tests with other yeah with other actors i forget which movie was which because i i think i'm mistaking it for hook because that one comes out a little bit later and during the casting for that i think hook came out before jurassic park right because it was uh, hook, yes. jurassic park yes. and schindler's list yeah 
Joseph Matarazzo, or no, I'm getting the two kids mixed up. Um, Mazzello? Mo- Maz- yeah, I had the name just a second ago. Yeah, Mazzello. He auditioned for the lead in Hook, and I guess he was like the second choice, and Spielberg remembered him. As Hook? He's like, you know, you're uh, no, the, I forget the kid's name, Michael? I know, uh, yeah. Jack. Jack. <clears throat> and he almost got it but spielberg was like you know what i have something else in the pipeline i can fit you in there instead and that's how he went on to do jurassic park and i i almost want to say something else happened with et as well but i don't i don't remember i wanted to do more research for this movie and i just didn't have the time to do it but i i feel like there was something similar with et but i could very well be wrong i only have like one piece of like trivia but it's pretty well known regarding like the reese's candy but aside from that, I don't know. Maybe I just have the two movies mixed up between this and Hook. I uh, chose this movie as Tim brought up. He has not seen this. When I learned of that, I was like, well, I'm going to choose it someday for the podcast. And here we are. And I'll wait until the end to really let you know what I think about it. <laughs> I might find out depending on your comments during the movie. <laughs> but this isn't... I mean, I like E.T. I wouldn't say it was something that I was like watching all the time growing up or this had a profound effect on me you know in my youth or in my movie going experience but it's wacky to think that the month this came out in june of 1982 oh yeah that it opened again or same month poltergeist blade runner and john carpenter's the thing big movies also, very awkward if your kids say, you want to go see the Alien movie, and instead of E.T., you take them into The Thing by mistake. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that I'm sure this movie was in theaters for the rest of the year, as things went back then. I mean, this thing was, what, it was a $10.5 million budget, and it grossed seven hundred and ninety-two point nine. Yeah, worldwide. Which I don't know uh, if that it, includes the re-releases, or if that was the initial I run. I don't think so. It unseated Star Wars as the highest grossing of all time, and it held that title until Jurassic Park, until he broke his own record with Jurassic Park. Spielberg writing a letter to himself in the newspaper. <laughs> yeah, those ads Great they job, take out. Great job, Steven. Full-page <laughs> ad, just self-grandstanding. You know, they do that thing with the whenever a movie tops another one at the box office, like most gross ever, the previous person usually kind of celebrates them and like does the yeah, homage we just it up. yeah lucas did that for spielberg yeah for et mm-hmm. i put the did he start that or was that chat. already a thing he might have started it actually no because jaws lost what well, jaws was the number one and then star wars beat it so i think i think spielberg did it first mm, and he did it so- after jurassic park did he did he have a highest grossing movie after that? I don't know. Because what the sure, one following th- that would have been probably Titanic. Right. Yeah. That was 97. Then when Titanic was beat, James Cameron said, I'm not sending anyone letters. <laughs> I'm working on Avatar. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Very James Cameron. I think I got to Star Wars, The Force Unleashed, and then that's kind of like, I don't think they did it anymore afterward. Or not The Force Unleashed. Wow. The Awakens. Just started happening too often where it just seemed like every... Yeah. It was like every new movie that came out just unseated the last. And it was just like, Honestly, right, yeah, we're kind of good on this. Well, I mean, it's every kinda... summer, once the Marvel movies started coming out, it just kept topping mm-hmm. and topping. Yeah, it, it's kind of bonkers to think about it now that it was like we had these such long gaps before something else really dethroned. And now it's just, unless it's specific miscommunication or miscalculation of how they're doing all of their analytics, but I feel like now it's. A new movie came out and it beat all the records. And then next week, and this one beat the last record. And so is it actually beating all of this? Or are we now adjusting the parameters of how exactly we're reporting so that everything is so much easier now? Including merchandising. Yeah. Or is it just literally because they're cost, the, they're raising the price on things? It's technically it did get more money. Not based on inflation, but it did get more money. Well, they do take that into account whenever they mention money. And whenever we do the research for every movie, it's always finding like the gross profit of the movie is the worst part for me because it's exactly that. It's, 
How much did this make theatrically during its initial run? And that's it. I don't care if it came out again or if it was like in Australia for an extra six weeks for whatever stupid reason. And the number constantly fluctuates because if you look up highest grossing for like Avengers Endgame, you're going to get like 15 different numbers. That's they should just really go by number of tickets sold. Yeah, I think that's the better that's one. Good it's point. like, OK, what if a bunch of people went and saw it on like five dollar Tuesday? Immediately, that's going to end up having <laughs> a lower price than if they went normally. Wait a second, Tim, where are you finding five dollar Tuesday theaters everywhere? Go to an AMC or a showcase. <laughs> Leave the metropolitan area or just do that. Just everything has a, a $5 Tuesday oh, for the most part. What? You know what? I just Googled because I know they say Gone with the Wind is the really the biggest selling film. And it actually has it listed by ticket sales with Gone with the Wind at the top with 202.2 million tickets sold. And under that, Star Wars, A New Hope, well, 178 million. The thing with Gone with the Wind, though, is that's constantly in a theatrical run. Yeah, it's not playing like for weeks on end, but, you know, it plays at least once or maybe five times a year, depending on like where you are for like, you know, when you go into like Showcase or, you know, AMC has like the retro things. They just did that Studio Ghibli marathon thing. Gone with the Wind comes up often. So I'm sure those sales are calculated into that gross total well, ever I'm, since the 40s. I'm wondering if they're including it, or I'm wondering if it's just for the case that back then there was no option for home video or streaming or anything. It's True. just like, you want to see a movie? You go to the movies. That's it. So probably any of these people like saw it multiple times, or everybody went because it was like, oh, it's the thing to do. I guess, I don't know if oh, you... Also, just before we move on, I just I just did a little Google search and how I didn't know that my theater does five dollar Mondays I will never know. But <laughs> David, I was going to ask if they had movie theaters in Vermont. Oh, that's funny. That's uh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, they have Nickel. You go up and like put your face in the in the in the screen and they play you a show. <laughs> I know um, you're like your face in the screen, but I'm picturing the movie screen and it's like Nightmare on Elm Street where you're just your face is just pushed out from the. <laughs> That poster for the Frighteners or the... I'm the... $5. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to Google it and there was a Reddit post from 12 years ago that states exactly what Nick was saying. That appara- I don't know where the research is from, but apparently he's saying it made most of its money... No, I'm sorry. It made $506 million, I think adjusted, in its first four years and eight other re-releases that brought its total to $3.3 billion adjusted for inflation. Yeah, that that makes sense. So I guess they do include it. Now we know. Now everyone knows at home. It's all bullshit. Most of the full body puppetry was performed by a two foot tall stunt man. The E.T. Do you know his name? <laughs> I don't know his name. I feel like you it's should. probably in the credits. <laughs> I feel like to use that as a fun fact without knowing his name. <laughs> I blame ID, IMDB. Apparently, okay, I mean, we'll look up the credits, maybe. I'm not going to. In the kitchen, they were done using a 12-year-old boy who was born without legs, but was an expert on walking on his hands. Holy shit, is this true? I like That's how kind of crazy. I like how you're discovering things in real time about this film for <laughs> listeners. We, we've just become like a 24-hour news cycle of, of this movie. <laughs> He's like, this just in. Is this true? I, Someone check this. <laughs> I I honestly read the first two thirds of this when I was pasting it into my notes, but I didn't realize he was walking on his hands. That, But it makes sense if he didn't have legs. But in any case, I wonder if there's any behind the scenes of I this film. Oh, there's, <laughs> there's a lot. I mean, I, I, I know I'm specifically the 40th showing the screen. It came with a ton of stuff. Specifically showing like those two people that are referenced there i'd be interested to see they probably even say their names probably but we won't know them the listeners won't know them history will forget them they'll only know it's unfortunate because for for their their (laughs) contribution they're probably buried in the credits as just stunt people i guess speaking to et himself he is i want i want to know the i want to see the designs that weren't used. I'm not saying E.T. is 
necessarily a bad design, but it's very interesting choice, I guess, that they landed on for me personally. I know he has an iconic look, but it's like, I'm interested to like, how do they set on this like kind of weird little short? Well, I kind of, like, I really like the legs. design on him just because I feel like so many movies that are geared towards kids, they try to make them too cutesy or they make them in a way that it's like, oh, this will sell merchandise of like, kids will all want to have a plush version of this. This one, E.T., even though he's benevolent and he's nice and he's cute. He's kind of grotesque. And like, if you change some features, he could be very horrific. But I think just because of the personality they give him and the softness they give him, it makes him endearing, which separates him from all the other ones of like later when you have all these like little Star Wars critters pop up that it's like, oh, you're clearly doing this because it's going to be the big push for everybody's going to want the electronic talking little Furbo from. No. I don't understand why this movie was as popular as it was when it comes to that. Because I was five, six when this movie came out. Fucking terrified me. Yeah. I hated it. I mean, that's that's one thing I kind of want to bring up with this movie is that it's shot like a horror film. Yes. Like, yes. Like, no, no, opening. <laughs> yeah, no, no pulled punches. If you changed, like, you could redub this movie. Just redub it. And it would be a horror <laughs> film. Well, I mean, well, you yeah. know, <laughs> maybe some editing, but yeah, I Tim. see your point. It makes sense that this originated from an idea for horror and then wanting to keep you kind of <clears throat> off balance in the beginning of, okay, which direction are we going this with that opening of just E.T. the extraterrestrial and you have this like ghostly, like moaning score going into the background and it really feels like we're going to about enter into a horror movie before all of a sudden it starts kind of transitioning to more of that like Amblin style. I mean, we open yeah, with I mean, that and then like the POV peeking through the like forest looking at the UFO. Yeah. I mean, you even have a, uh, the scene when, when Elliot, you know, rediscovers ET and sees him fully for the first time is a jump scare. It just, they execute it differently so that it isn't. Yeah. But like, in in every in every like definition of a jump scare it is like it does the slow build up he's walking through there is, you can't see a lot of things then you get this quick reveal et shrieks in his weird shrieky voice like it is a jump scare it's just it it lingers longer so you don't get that impact from it but like this this has like classic horror setups yeah, the one of the reasons i know to the cinematographer was because of how it was shot every interior day or night and every night exterior it's super contrasty it's like there's a high shooting contrast ratio like with the shadows that are used in the movie i mean day exteriors you, you know it is what it is because the sun's out but every other time they can control the light it is very moody it's very dark oh yeah they shot the hell out of this movie it looks great it's just an interesting to David's point, like it could be a horror. Like it, it's it's not something. It's not a style you would expect for this kind of movie, but it works. Did you hear about the sequel intent? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I on the IMDb notes I did. That's uh, that's all. That's as far as I got. Yeah, I found the actual treatment that Spielberg wrote, and <laughs> it. Um. Yeah. For listeners that don't know, this this movie made a lot of money. So when movies make a lot of money. <laughs> What's the first thing studios want? A sequel. And Spielberg didn't. But he was contracted to come up with something despite how much he wanted to. It, it's a one and done thing. We're done. There's nothing more to say in this story. It's finished. I don't want to do a sequel. So the studio forced him to write something so that they can at least, you know, see what sticks, what doesn't. And Spielberg just did a hard turn and just like, you know what? Fine. I'm writing the most explicit horror movie I can think of using everything from the previous movie. You guys will never make this into a movie. Here you go. Here's the 10 page treatment. And they're like, they, they called it or they, they refused to call his bluff. And it's like, Nope, you're right. You're right. We're done. We won't do this. Yeah. ET two nocturnal fears. There was going to be like a race of albino aliens that I guess like torture ET and like torture the kids or something like that. They kidnap the children. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. I do remember hearing that. There is actually a sequel to the novelization of E.T. 
So anybody that really likes novelizations out there, William Kotzwinkel, who did the original E.T. novelization, did a second one called E.T., The Book of the Green Planet. That was about E.T. back on his planet and then trying to return to check on Elliot. And it wasn't like horrific or anything. It was very much in the vein of the original <laughs> E.T. Um, I love it was just a movie book. Yeah, I love those. <laughs> The yeah, when E.T. gets there, he raises his finger up, says ouch, and then pulls a gun and shoots Elliot. He's not gonna hurt you, Mom. I mean, he's not gonna hurt you. He's not gone! And they start taking over the planet. I always felt the ride was enough of a sequel, if anything, because <laughs> you got to see the alien planet, and it's really oh, shit. I don't remember. It's it's like Fraggle Rock. But more alien, I guess. I don't know. Like, I don't know how to describe it. I mean, the the ride is seriously old and it, yeah. it shows. But at the very yeah. least, you know, you got to see the alien planet. And then that that's really all I needed out of E.T. Also, <laughs> so in 2019, there was an Xfinity commercial that's like five minutes or six minutes long. Oh, called yeah. E.T. and Me, A Holiday Reunion. And Henry Thomas comes back. Oh, right. Henry Thomas comes back for an That's Xfinity right. commercial and gives a thousand percent like his rent is due. <laughs> like <laughs> it probably was. So I forgot it, about that. It's actually it's not it doesn't feel as much of a like shill of oh Xfinity. Sure, there's Xfinity stuff in it, but it more so they play it off as like E.T.'s back. He gets to meet Elliot's family now that he's grown up. And he's showing him of like, oh, they're looking on the Internet and E.T. is seeing all the advances that man has made since then of like check this out check that out and then he like takes the kids on a bike ride and then they drop them off and he flies away again and it really feels not like oh it's a, a, a commercial entirely it feels like it could be a little short like vignette in the et world because it's just done in a a fun playful way thought it worked yeah i forgot that existed I truly never had anything against E.T. It's just that Spielberg's treatment for the first story was clean, cut, and dry. Like, that's it. Like, there's there's really no reason to return. And I don't, I don't know. Like, just, I think the little thing that they did with Henry Thomas a few years back, I think is, like, perfect. It's like, hey, you know, he's still alive. We're willing to redo the puppet. Here you go. This is a quick little thing. And that's really all that was needed because... I mean, just like Jaws and Jurassic Park, E.T. wasn't in it the full, like, five, ten minutes or however long that ad was. He was only in it for, like, a few shots and that's it. Yeah, and, like, there was nothing ever alluded to that there was anything bigger going on, right? Like, there's there's no mystery. There's no world building done around E.T. It's just like, hey, here's this little alien guy. There's an adventure. I, I mean, after watching the movie, I, I don't feel like there's... Like, Spielberg didn't lead on that there was anything else to explore. Right. Yeah. So, the original ending, um, evidently, so Robert McNaughton, who played Mike, did an interview a while back where he talked about the original scripted ending that didn't, like, lead into a sequel, but it left it a little bit more open, in a sense, because the whole thing was supposed to end after E.T. takes off. With then it flashes forward a little bit, and now they're still playing D and D like bookends at the beginning of the movie. Except now Elliot is leading the D and D session as the DM, and it's like, oh, like now he's part of that group, and now he's able to kind of like take a little more charge. And then it slowly pans up through the house, and you see the communicator that they built on the roof still communicating with ET. So it's like, okay, so he left, but they still have contact, and they're still mm. in communication with each other. So. It, in that sense, it's not like, oh, it's a cliffhanger for a mo second movie, but it's like, okay, but if we wanted to do a second movie, it definitely would make sense of, yeah, they're still in contact. It's not like so long and he leaves forever kind of thing. That's what starts the war because they're inadvertently sending like horrible insults into space. Yeah, they don't actually control when it sends, so it's just constantly open channel. So E.T. is hearing everything. <laughs> penis breath he called me penis breath so that's why at the end of the movie when et gets back on the ship and you're like oh he's home and then he gets ushered onto the command council and he sits down you see the little subtitle <laughs> and he's like begin the attack as they take off we have to <laughs> they can't be left alive <laughs> i've seen enough <laughs> um yeah i don't 
I, you know, as a kid, I can say when I when I saw this, probably, I mean, like everybody, it was either on VHS rented, or somebody taped it, and you 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 saw it that way. It was on TV, but uh, yeah, David and Nick, do you have any like fond ET memories, or is it just yeah, it's just a movie from our childhood? I didn't like it as a kid. I mean, I it was that's it, right, that's right. So no just, fun, no fun. It scared <laughs> me. A lot because I mean the 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 creature design, he's not cute, and then it's just every five minutes he's screaming and it's not a pleasant scream. Ah. <laughs> uh. I love it. <laughs> like R2-D2. <laughs> R2 at least is a little bit more No, you can't defend comical. R2's yeah. scream. <laughs> Easily. He's, he's the only uh, droid that sounds like he's genuinely experienced existential dread. <laughs> and high levels of pain. No, it's a huge difference between the two sound designs. And this one was just like, as a kid, it it, it didn't sit well with me. And I, I didn't like it. I mean, over the years... As I, you know, eventually I finished watching it before the age of 10, but it was like a one and done thing. And I just, I, eh, I think in 2005 when, or like around that time, they did the special edition nonsense that like Spielberg loved what George Lucas right. did with the special editions of Star Wars that he did something similar. And I remember rewatching it then just to see all the extra scenes that they did. And there's some stupid stuff in the, the special, like, oh, we decided to remove the guns from the film. So when the cops yeah. are running after them, we CGI'd walkie-talkies into all their hands, but they're holding the walkie-talkies with like a finger, like it's <laughs> like holding a shoot. trigger. <laughs> yeah. So they're running, holding walkie-talkies, like they're about to fire a message off. Yeah, and they did a few other things like that. And it's uh, and they, they were completely CGI'd him in a few shots. Mm. And it, I mean, it, I didn't feel it ruined the movie by any means, but at the same time, it was just like, I felt this was unnecessary. Also, but thankfully, Spielberg thought the same thing. And then in the release, the major release afterward, he pulled all the changes back. And now it's the theatrical cut once again, where it's the puppet, not CGI. Which it's bonkers to me that during the special edition, they would decide like, oh, we're going to add CGI for E.T. And it's like, Carlo Rimbaldi won an Oscar for this puppet. And then you decide, you know what, actually, that Oscar-winning puppet, we're going to replace it with CGI. Oh, that's a well, good point. I mean, it, not to detract and digress into Star Wars, but that was a big point of contention with the fans when it came to the special editions, because people took a long time creating the Death Star, for instance, for that model to be exploded on film. Same thing with the whole Death Star battle. And then when they replace shots completely or add CGI to a lot of them, the film that was submitted for Oscar approval is not the same one that you're currently watched today. So it really kind of puts it into perspective that, you know, all the special effects work that was awarded, it's not the same anymore. So, yeah, which I mean, so Carlo Rimbaldi, I don't know if any of you had anything you were going to talk about for him. We've mentioned him before on the show just because he also worked on the werewolf in Silver Bullet, but then all of his other previous work, like he worked with Spielberg on Close Encounters of the Third to Third Kind. I mean, he worked on stuff like Barbarella. He did Conan the Destroyer. He did a bunch of like Italian horror, like Bay of Blood, Four Flies on Grey Velvet. He did Possession, Alien. So, I mean, by the time that he did this, it was already like a well-established career, even though the Oscar was shared with Industrial Light and Magic. I mean, the green screen work, I think there's only so much you could do at the time, like chroma keying and everything. Yeah, there's definitely some stuff with the green screen. That I would appreciate, like, seeing, like, oh, a nice cleaned up version. But, yeah, the CGI of the the guns, but, I mean, mainly E.T., like, yeah, that's a slap in the face and totally unnecessary. The guns didn't bother me as much as the E.T. CGI. It definitely is, you can tell it's like the 2000s attempt at it and it's yeah yeah i didn't i haven't actually seen the version of the cgi the one that i watched the other day was the the blu-ray theatrical 
And this was probably like the second time I've ever seen this movie because I saw it once when I, ki- when I was a kid and I didn't, I didn't like it very much. Um, Same reason. So I kind of just, I saw it. I was like, Oh, okay. That was, eh. and then I kind of forgot about it. <laughs> Was it the same? Time. Did you not like it for the same reason? I I don't remember. I I think a lot of it. I mean, when I say I was a kid, <laughs> I probably saw this when I was in like, I don't know, like eleven, twelve. So a little bit later, even than maybe the this. No, that was probably the target. Um, David was watching. Like, I remember. Being like, Why does this fool get an alien? <laughs> I remember the <laughs> opening sequence being creepy. Like I do really remember that. But I don't know. This one just it. It didn't click with me as a kid for some reason. Um, I don't entirely remember why, but it was just it was just one of those movies where I just kind of I kind of wrote it off a little bit. Um, but then again, I think like when I was younger, like you know, preteen to early teens, um, I think coming of age movies never really clicked with me. Um, like I like I don't know, and I know Spielberg has a lot of coming of age movies. And a lot of them I just kind of skipped over for the most part. Um, and I think this was just just kind of fell into that for me. I mean, I think I get like a lot of that type of film works better once you are past that point in your life to look back at it fondly or look back at it nostalgically, as opposed to like you're watching other kids like having an adventure. Sometimes the adventure part is fun, but the whole like the coming of age piece or like the childhood piece is lost on you. I knew what the hell was going on. You're like, this is going to be influential as I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> got to watch out for them ETs and I got to know, to release the frogs and stuff. Government. <laughs> Jingly keys, scary. <laughs> <laughs> Key boy. All right. I guess that's enough preamble. Let's talk about this film proper. I mean, the movie's big enough. We can keep preambling and no s- skip the we full can. movie. We could, we could just do a whole half hour right now. What's wrong with the mom in this? <laughs> what, wait, Why what's wrong with the mom? kids call her Mary? And like, I, think, I thought she just called her Mary once. All of the kids at one point call her Mary. Mm, maybe they're pissed that... When dad divorced like, you, we lost respect. Yes, honestly. May, maybe, maybe there's something to that. What's the matter, Mom? Oh, Mexico. <laughs> uh, you want to elaborate, Mom? <laughs> it's like we're like eyeing the camera, like nervously. Go further, Mom. Your father's in Mexico. Oh, okay. <laughs> I hate Mexico. Just driving angry out of the driveway. <laughs> Mexico. <laughs> and their orange filters. <laughs> Mike is pretty defensive of mom, though, in that one scene, so I think he's sympathetic. Yeah, I do like Mike throughout this, because I feel like so many films have the older brother be like, he causes problems, or it's like, he's the one who, like, somebody in the family's gonna rat them out. And despite the, like, headbutting that all the three kids do initially, they kind of get over it quick, and it's like, no, actually, all of them work good as a team. (laughs) Yeah, I appreciated also how quickly in the story that Gertie and Mike find out about E.T. And it's not like Elliot is trying to hide him like the whole first mm-hmm. half of the movie. Yeah, it's it's not like this Chekhov's gun of like, OK, at, at what point is this going to come back and bite him because he's not revealed? It's like, nope, out of the gate. It's I found an alien and everybody's on board. <laughs> he's a goblin man. Yeah, I feel like in a lot of films that would have been an entire arc where you have that tension yeah. of like, oh, man, he's going to find out. And he's going to tell mom. Yeah. And then they talk. And then it gets resolved. Yeah. But instead, we just kind of like jump right into it because, you know, Spielberg had other things that he wanted to talk about in this film. Even with the the opening where they're playing D&D and Elliot wants to be involved and his friends are kind of are buzzing him off. It didn't feel like his brother is like totally just, you know, shits on his little brother all the time. He, he obviously cares for him. Well, I mean, um, even it's not like get out of here. Or, like you can't do anything. It was like. Finally, he just relented of, okay, here's the money. Go get the pizza. And then think of your character. When you come back, you'll take over after Greg's done. I was confused when he was going to get the pizza. They're requesting toppings. I'm like, guys, the pizza <laughs> uh, isn't it on the way. 
I was like, unless this guy just goes house to house with a trunk full of pizzas, and you're just like, or the hey, toppings. What do you got it. today? And he's like, oh, we have a. He's got a, a pizza uh, a, a pizza oven on a trailer, and he's like making it making it as he gets there. Man, California's got it all. <laughs> uh, before we end up in the the D and D match and the the pizza thing. Like we mentioned with the horror opening for this, and then we have like all of these random people chasing down the mm. aliens and the UFO. Including Mr. Keys. And we have, like when they show the ship itself, it's so much more like nature-esque than I was expecting with like plants and trees just growing wild on it. And then we see like they're collecting different things. They're collecting a, like a small tree to bring on there. They've been to Endor you don't know that. Wouldn't, oh, they, <laughs> wouldn't they have trees at this point? We don't know if they've been to Endor. It's just because they appear in the Their council? Race has. What do you mean? We don't know that. It's it's an <laughs> Easter egg. It's not like canon or anything like that. I mean, Isn't I'm assuming that if they physically appear in that film, that they're a part of that universe. It's well, also it's, not, it's even, still it's not in, even like a small like walk by the camera. Like... They're in the Senate, which means that their planet is recognized as a part of the Republic. <laughs> which means that somebody voted them in. And also, just a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. So even if they can transcend the massive astronomical distance between our galaxy and the Star Wars one, it happened a long time ago. So they might have lost the Endor trees. <laughs> Endor is gone by it's the time gone. we roll around. <laughs> They're like, yeah, I mean, in, global warming, guys. In old legends, after the second Death Star blew up, they said there was supposed to be like an apocalypse that happened on Endor because a honeycomb structure the size of a small moon just blew up over it. So all that r- rained down onto the forest moon and destroyed it. So, so, okay. so, I guess, so this makes sense then. So they're out reclaiming more trees yes, to try to repopulate. Literally, yeah. That makes yes. sense. And they... They thought the redwoods of Northern California were the perfect replacement. It's I mean, perfect. they're good trees. They're good trees. I mean, in that that shot where it, pan, it it you know pitches down to you know where the ship is, if you were to put fireworks there, it would have looked like the ending to Return of the Jedi. It it would have. That's why immediately I was like, but these guys have been to Endor. <laughs> <laughs> they might still be at Endor. Before they get chased away by what I assume is a Ford commercial from 1982, when all of a sudden he started running, you had all these like F-150s all pull up at different angles and guys start getting out of it and they're slowly like panning up the fronts of the vehicles. It's worth noting, living out in California, like obviously the shots of their their suburban neighborhood and where E.T. first looks down after leaving, you know, leaving the rest of his, his people, and that's why he gets left in the first place. Well, he's not he leaving the rest so of his people. The rest of his people are leaving him. Yeah. <laughs> if we they, understood they E.T. Him. at this point, we would find out he's damning his peers to hell, like, fist in the sky. Yeah, I mean, that was the biggest, like, screw you, man, we're leaving, like, ever. <laughs> he goes and looks down at the city, and it looks like pretty much it's the valley in, in Los Angeles. and But the forest, where everything else takes place, where they go to outside of the house, it's funny just because it's geographically that's hundreds of miles to the north in a, in a, in in the redwood forest. Wait, are we back like to a small two, soldier situation? Those two ecosystems do not sit right next to each other that you can bike there comfortably. I mean, there's there's ski mountains down he, down here that you can drive to in 2 hours, but you're not you're not living up against the hill and riding your bike up up an hour into the into the hills to get to those forests. It's just funny how they juxtapose those two areas. That makes sense, but it's so disappointing to hear you say that because I just assumed in my head of like, this is such a cool neighborhood. I would love to live here. <laughs> no, the the one the big note that I have, it takes place in like 10, 15 minutes from like this where we are in the movie, but it's fitting here. So Dean, <clears throat> this takes place in somewhere in California. So as a California resident, is it common for suburbia to have a cornfield in your backyard? That I yep, yeah, that was I thought about that in the, some of the shots oh, that we yeah. see of his house, and I'm like, wait a minute. Where the fuck did the corn come from? <laughs> <laughs> California corn. 
there might be corn around here. There's plenty of farms out here, but they're not in the middle of a suburban neighborhood. So that's that's like almost, I would say that's more egregious than where the hell did that drop off come from the T-Rex's paddock next to the cars? Well, also the fact that all the vegetation is so arid. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime we have these aerial shots of the neighborhood, it looks like a very cookie cutter, like residential, like yeah. it's suburbia. Any one of those, like, you know, quickly built up communities. And it's just like, where is the corn <laughs> going to be? <laughs> Don't think about it. Well, also, just looking at their front lawn, their front lawn is completely grassless. <laughs> yeah. Each house is less than half an acre. But she put, she put down like, four rows of six corn and Elliot just happened to run through just those. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. Or are we supposed to assume that the corn is very tall and Elliot is very small? I mean, he is kind of small, (laughs) except at the end when he has to bend down to hug E.T., which like threw me for a little bit. But (laughs) yeah, just extend your neck up to hugging height. Just hug his head. Well, in the shot, it's in it's very cinematic when they go outside to the lit shed and you see like the it's moon. It's awesome. Yeah. There's no mountains there. So I really have no idea where this cornfield would truly be. I feel like it was a part of the script and they're like, oh, you shit. know what? We're not going to change this. I don't. <laughs> We're going to keep this part where it actually takes place in the Midwest. So uh, we love the cornfield. The thing that I find even weirder that I can't explain is aside from the cornfield, they tell Elliot that he can play with them if he grabs the pizza and he picks up a single pizza for five kids. Yeah. And then he <laughs> leaves it outside. And then when they go back in, he, they still leave it outside. Well, yeah. Which I, and then they're like, I, uh, they the find pizza the pizza was... box and they're like, Elliot, you left it. He's like, I'm sorry. It was an accident. It wasn't an accident. You specifically dropped it there to go. And then you just, everybody leaves it anyway. He's holding the pizza balanced <laughs> on like a baseball glove. Like he's coming from the Kino school of pizza delivery. And then he yeah. just like abandons it. At least it wasn't vertical. I have it. I have one of my notes <laughs> is like the pizza. Yes, there's cheese stuck to the, but eat it. That's rest, that's fine. That's fine to eat. Take it in and eat some of it, please. Yeah. Well, also I like how when Elliot sees the light coming from the shed and he throws the ball in and it comes back out and he runs in screaming that there's something out there. All of the boys immediately walk over to the knife block and each grab a knife on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna fuck this thing up. I wanted to talk about this scene so bad. Like, <laughs> who are these kids that, oh man, there's something outside, and immediately they all grab knives. Well, like, considering- oh, let's, let's go get it. And I'm like, what is this? I mean, it uh, makes sense when later in the movie, when Mike just calls the, his boys and he's just like, get to the playground. Like, they're like fighting the government and all of his boys just put masks on. They're like, let's do this. <laughs> I'm like, you guys. <laughs> it's like you live in a suburban neighborhood where your neighbor can hear you playing in your backyard and you heard something in the garage and you're going to grab knives to go stab it. It's probably the neighbor. Like (laughs) maybe crime is high in that neighborhood and we just don't really know about it. What got me too was that one of them tried to like poke Mike's mom's butt and he had to stop, but he was really close. Like what if he actually did like, wait, like as a, as a, as a goof. Yeah. What was the number that? No, no, with his finger. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that for some reason. Ah, I gotcha. <laughs> or I missed it. I mean, the, the other thing is the fact that they said, because oh, the reason they grabbed the knives and went out is they said like, oh, it may be the coyotes back again. So right. clearly they know that things like animals are being attracted. So they leave the box of pizza outside to potentially attract more animals. <laughs> They go out there, it's Peter Coyote, and they start attacking him. <laughs> the Coyote's back again. No, I'm Peter Coyote. He's got keys this time. Um, speaking of the Coyote, when they go to check the shed to see what um, Elliot saw, they, they look down at the footprints. What do you think a Coyote's foot looks like? You know it's like a dog, not right? It's not three-toed. <laughs> the three-toed huge footprints i don't know how (laughs) them finding the footprint didn't prove that elliot was right yeah must be a coyote meanwhile it's like not no footprint anyone has ever seen it's like three toed six inch by six inch (laughs) if it's a coyote this thing has to be like five feet tall 
It's like, oh, it is a horror movie about a mutant coyote. <laughs> <laughs> what if those weren't E.T.'s footprints and there is the coyote still in town? <laughs> the agents came here for that and they're like, oh my God, there's an alien? <laughs> yeah, that backyard is super cinematic uh, with that matted in shot of the moon. <laughs> but it's lit pretty cool. But they, I mean, if they leave those shed lights on all night long, they're blasting inside there. I'm, I'm... I'm fine with people with li- lighting things that to look cool, even if it doesn't make totally sense. Like make it look cool. That's what's I mean, it, important. it is such a like perfect shot every time they yeah. show that of like the yeah. wide of the light coming out with the corn with the moon in the background. Like it's such a great shot. I guess to David's horror point, after they go back in the house and you know it's like ET's hand just wraps around the side of the door frame, like very very foreboding. <laughs> Like, yeah, I mean, and I it think, tightens I think and the wood starts to crack. <laughs> like, I, that's one of my favorite things about the film is just how it's shot and how it's lit. Like, I mean, I think sometimes it, and and you know, I kind of think this about the music as well. Is like sometimes I don't think it fits the subject matter, where like because like the lighting is so dramatic and the the camera work is is so. I mean, I don't want to use the word dramatic again, but like. Um, like so heavy contrasting and like so cinematically shot for like a kid's coming of age movie that has like a funny little alien and also the music I felt at sometimes the, like the the music like the score for it was doing was for a much more dramatic movie than the movie I was watching I don't know I think it, it the the John Williams score has like a whimsy to it with the like the flutes and whatnot that makes it nice that when he knows it's time to go to a 10, he goes to a 10 and it just makes every scene. The the last note I have for this movie mentions that I, I feel John You're Williams already saved, saved this movie <laughs> that so many times, if it weren't for the score, this movie would have been horror. Well, and I mean, it was like John, like John's job. John, it's weird to call him John. John Williams's job to every single time it had that if you just watched it on mute it would have it would lean too heavy in the horror direction but it was him keeping you grounded that entire time making you realize this isn't a horror movie because if you swapped his score out with from from alien you would have been expecting elliot to die the second he walked into that cornfield yeah i mean like keeping it with all of the like the woodwinds and the the lighter brass and whatnot makes it sound like I said before, like it sounds more whimsical. It sounds a little bit lighter. If we also didn't have the scene in the beginning of actually seeing the alien ET, like, oh, picking up plants and walking inside. If we didn't get that scene and it was just people showing up and we see a figure being left behind as the thing takes off, all of this would still be a horror movie. Because until we get the reveal in the cornfield of them both screaming, you would think, this could very well go in a different direction. Right. But even, even some of the later like development of the story where ET essentially forms a parasitic relationship with Elliot, where he's leeching the life off of him. I have questions on that. Like, later. I don't know if that's what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of it's, questions on that. It's later. still, a, it's still a horror concept. I mean, he's basically venom, except you don't get cool transforming <laughs> powers. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the science the science around ET's powers is you know, they don't explore it. That's fine. Well, also the fact that he makes things float and it's like so he's telekinetic sometimes? Yes. They don't really explore it and it's it's fine. It's not the point of the movie. They cover it in the sequel. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they don't they don't really cover it. And like because like E.T. is like science fiction adjacent. It's not really a science fiction movie. They just used an alien as the stand-in to tell the story. (laughs) For the Christ-like figure that dies and returns. (laughs) Of this, like, how do we, like, how do we, like, tell the narrative of that, like, that, like, nostalgic, childlike, whimsy friendship that, like, goes beyond, like, the normal borders. And so they're just like, yeah, alien. It's like. All right, yeah. Like we're not going to explore the alien side that much, but about the uh, the power of friendship. It's uh, Steven Spielberg's first shonen. <laughs> I feel Spielberg 
is a horror enthusiast but refuses to just make a horror movie himself because aside yes. from jaws looking at his um we got like war of the worlds and Duel. the one from the 2000s yeah he likes um he did that i guess thrills uh thrills yeah. not chills is what he yeah. does cuz i mean like between that you know temple of doom was very i mean jurassic I park has scary. horror moments to it it's a horror book. It's a yeah, horror it's a book. monster movie. I mean, I was yeah. I was scared of Jurassic Park when I first saw it. That was twenty six. Yeah. <laughs> and then leading up to that point, it just seems like he had a lot of thing. And I know he had a lot to do with Poltergeist too. Even though he's not mm. listed, he practically co directed the damn thing. Arguable to this day, but his fingerprints are on it. Yeah, I'd rather watch Poultry Geist. When Elliot first sees ET in the cornfield. E.T. seems so aware, like, when the guys are coming in the beginning and he's running from them. Elliot just basically is shining that flashlight into the cornfield for <laughs> several minutes. And E.T.'s just, like, fucking off doing whatever and like, is surprised by Elliot. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he had more awareness. He was waiting for his contact in the government because he's the one who called the agents on the rest of his people. <laughs> and here comes that scream. I'm your yeah, whistleblower. Was- he was promised as much cores as he could ever want to drink. <laughs> that was his We've payment. been stealing trees for years. Yeah, e- e- E.T.'s level of intelligence seems to like flash and wane significantly in this movie. <laughs> I, mean, this I thought I back- remember reading something like years ago that E.T. is like a kid. And that's why the rest of oh, his people like left because they just didn't realize he was on the ship or something. No, they like he look at away. him and leave. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> They're like, we can make another. I think, I'm pretty sure they could feel that he was not on the ship and they were like, I think they it's, probably hated him. It was probably. <laughs> if they'd left him on purpose. It's like, oh, finally, he's like fucked off in the middle of the woods somewhere. Go. Well, it's Whoa. like, go, 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 go. You Robot can- <laughs> Chicken did a whole sketch about it, how they like got rid of him on purpose because he's like. <laughs> He's a moron. <laughs> you know, like, and like the real aliens, all 10 of their fingers light up and they can do so much more, but only ET's only one of his fingers work. So they just purposely ditched him on the planet. That's pretty good. Also, the I fact mean, that like they couldn't miss him when their entire chest glows like that. That's what I mean. They were obviously linked. And to Nick's point, they why does it take E.T. calling for them to come back? Do they think, like, we can never go back because those guys kind of saw us? Or, like, just go back and get him. Like, what's the it's big like deal? A little, like a little kid calling, Mom, I fucked up. Or, like, Mom, I, I made a mistake. Can you come pick me up? <laughs> Collect call for. I'm on Earth. Come to pick you up. <laughs> Whoever at Hershey's made the deal for Reese's Pieces is the... I hope they got a raise. I mean, I know because, Mars passed on it. Yep. And I'm sure they were kicking themselves afterwards. Yeah. From what I heard, mm-hmm. this launched Reese's, at least and the pieces, but I mean, it, it, the, the sales did very well after this movie. Yeah. I mean, I mean, this movie is chock a full of, of ad placements. <laughs> For the I mean, weirdest were, things though. <laughs> they weren't wrong though. Cause at least even Mars was like, this movie looks a little too scary for kids. We don't want our name attached to this. And then here we are, 30, 40 years later, saying the exact thing on how this is borderline a horror movie. <laughs> and they were able to see it before the worldwide phenomenon. Because I, I don't know that many people that really look at this movie with such endearment on how so many articles and stuff say. Like The only thing of E.T. I will say I would love the most is probably the ride at Universal Studios is probably my favorite one. But aside from that, I mean, I don't know. As a first time view, five stars, no notes. On uh, Reese's Pieces? On, on E.T.? E.T. <laughs> Never had I mean, Reese's, Reese's Pieces before. Five stars, certainly. Five stars. <laughs> That's my movie theater candy of choice. Hell honestly. yeah. Um, yeah, Mr. Keys. I knew, I didn't remember that they kept like the faces of the quote unquote bad guys uh, hidden for so long. It does make it more sinister. Even when they have it of like them walking with the sun behind them or whatnot, it's always like the silhouette that you never see the face until right towards the end when they finally show up. 
I have to say, I guess there's two sides where one, I find a lot of the reactions to the reactions and responses to an alien or maybe just the interactions between the kids pretty realistic. But then later, speaking of the bad guys, when they, when they end up descending upon the the house because they know E.T.'s inside wearing full on spacewalk astronaut suits. Yeah, no and they hazmat. Don't, they don't NASA suits. They don't they don't say anything. They just open the door. They they reach their arms out like zombies. They're like not another opens to the, the family. window and starts climbing over their couch. <laughs> it's Terrifying. like a zombie attack, honestly. I didn't remember that scene from my from my first viewing. So watching it this time, I'm like, is, this is a dream sequence, right? Because it's even <laughs> lit like one where you have like these really intense lights just coming in from the windows of the house. And it looks very like poltergeisty with how the lighting yeah. was done. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this is a dream sequence. And, and then and then we get that scene where the mother is like, this is my house. And I'm just like, oh, this isn't a dream <laughs> sequence. <laughs> it had to be a dream sequence. Why would they send actual astronauts to go investigate this? <laughs> so we just different... came from the moon. We heard there was an alien. <laughs> We've been tracking him from space. <laughs> from the cornfield and I think the end of the movie with E.T. laying there all pale and stuff and the astronauts coming in. I, those are the big things that made me not like it as a kid. Mm. That that scene when when they find E.T. in the river, I was like, yeah, I was really taken back by up. that. I was just like, like, they when they lose track of him and then the older brother goes and finds E.T. And it just pans him by the river. My reaction, I was just, oh, fuck. Like, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he has yeah, a he... tiny knife in his side. <laughs> it's like, I, I originally, I thought like the raccoon was eating his legs and I thought he had no legs. And I was like, oh. <laughs> oh, is there a raccoon? I didn't even realize there was a raccoon. Yeah, there was a raccoon, a raccoon next to it. That's when Mike was like, go away. Oh, right. But yeah, Mike was like visibly like, oh, fuck. He like knew, obviously he's, his skin is so pale, but Mike was like terrified in that in that scene for E.T. I think Mike doesn't get enough credit for this just because he's like an older kid actor in this. Everybody always he's talks great. about what a job Drew Barrymore and Henry Thomas. Like, I think he also did an amazing job. Yeah, he Mike did. is great. I liked how he wasn't just the asshole older brother. Like, yeah, yeah. he gave Elliot a hard time, but that's what right. older brothers do. But when he came down to like, I need to be a brother to this kid. He is. Yeah. He obviously respected him. And he has, yeah, he has funny reactions and lines in the movie too. Name some of them. Oh, they're in, they're in the notes. <laughs> they're in the notes. And and to be fair, like, like Gertie did try to like turn them in. Like she had the whole sequence with the mom at the refrigerator being like, mom, I want to show you something. Oh, um, she's and like, like that's and no. ET's right there. He's like, "Come on, I want to show I you." I like that. I did like that. I didn't think that was malicious. That was just being a little fucking brat of a kid. Yeah, yeah I true. actually didn't like Gertie. Like everybody talks what? about, like precocious like character that's so great, and I'm like, I think Drew Barrymore did a great job. I like Drew Barrymore. Yeah. Yeah. Gertie was annoying because it's like, Gertie, you are not helping most of these situations. Yeah, you know, I, I think like Gertie. We, I, I don't like kids, so. That's the prime example of child I don't like. I love when she's like, they show the shot of his feet, and she's like, I don't like his feet. <laughs> I don't know. That that line got me out of more than the other ones. Like That's the when E.T. Like, shows up at the river with no feet. <laughs> um, I hired the raccoons to take his feet. <laughs> part of me want, is like, I love the the slapstick and kind of comedy elements in this, and I'm like, I want more and more, but they probably wouldn't have stood out as much if they had a lot of it. Um, did you watch the by a much the, more serious? Did you film. watch the special edition? No, they added it. There is more scenes when Elliot's at school and it's when ET gets drunk. There's like two or three extra things that ET does. Mm. I mean, I guess to my point, I was like, I don't think it's. I don't. Th- I want it, but I don't think it would help because it's like it, it's a good balance because those moments just. Sprinkled in, I think, work a lot better. Like when uh, Gertie's meeting him, and there's that shot in the closet, and she's screaming and run and goes off, and he comes like screaming, like hobbling into the closet, like that. That to me is, I laughed out loud. I, I, all of all of ET's screams, I enjoy. I love his screaming. I think they should have put in one Wilhelm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'd be so mad. 
they do an extended scene where he ends up in the river and he like falls off the bridge and he just does the Wilhelm screen as he face plants into the water. (laughs) E.T. when he's like cold and white laying on the ground just before they zip him up in the bag, he lets out one Howie scream. (laughs) (laughs) When uh, E.T. is... It drifts out as they close the coffin case. (laughs) When E.T. was taking and returning or like taking all the Reese's pieces and returning them because Elliot you know, left him there. I think he only picked them up because he's kind of like an earth first kind of guy or a planet first. So he probably just saw it as like, this kid is littering and I'm going to bring it back to him. (laughs) Or I wonder if it was a case of he thought like, Oh, those are his things and he lost them or he left them behind, Mm -hmm. which it's probably like, I know what it feels like to be left behind. So he brings all his reason. The thing that I thought was weird is later when they're like in the forest and the agents are looking around and he sees the Reese's pieces and he reaches down, you see the human hand. It's like, he found it. There's somebody here. But then you hear a munch noise. Yeah, I know. I was going to bring that like, up. I was like, did, oh, did he, he eat just, it? Did this guy just, <laughs> <laughs> did he just eat a handful of Reese's pieces off the ground? I can't the resist those Reese's pieces. <laughs> oh, piece of candy. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. It just pans up to his face and he's just like covered in chocolate. Even the subtitles say it. <laughs> oh, a crunch? Yeah. Crunch noise? Well, I mean, you know, they had to make good on that contract with the endorsement. E.T. Like, is oh, a brand so, show. so irresistible, you even eat one left by alien. <laughs> You'll eat found trash Reese's pieces off the ground. I, uh, I'm a fan of the whole drunk sequence. I think, I guess they kind of slowly introduce that connection, that emotional slash mental connection that they have. They do, um, and that's I, like the that's just glaringly obvious during this scene. But um, I didn't realize it, it until the the beer scene. the The whole connection thing is just like I feel a, it's a rule of cool. It's just that's part of the story. Don't think twice of it. It's just yeah. I I really don't get on how that symbiotic relationship starts. Well, I, no, I understand why it starts, but then I don't understand on why Et dies. And then comes back to life like seconds later without any other intervention. Like, and why E.T. was dying to begin with, I don't fully understand yeah. why. Him dying, I don't think is totally understood. I, I I was writing a note as after he died that like, okay, this is a little too Disney where Elliot says like, I love you. And it's like, then he comes back to life. But then yep. he says, I think it's kind of what happens is his people are coming and that's why his heart, that's why he lights up. So I think the either that's it's the proximity or the fact that they're that close that brings him back to life essentially. So I wrote that off as like, okay, it's maybe not as just Elliot loves him and that's why he woke up. I mean, I also it's didn't more, really uh, understand to his aliens. like the flowers dying and then coming back and then dying and then coming back because it ha- they do like four scenes of the flowers dying mm-hmm. and then coming back. Even when E.T. is still alive and fine, all of a sudden they have a shot of, like, the flowers dying. And I was wondering, like, wait, so why all of a sudden are the, are those, like, supposed to be dead flowers? And E.T.'s been actively keeping them alive this entire time. And now... <laughs> all of his life force is just to keep flowers alive. Maybe maybe that's what it was. Because, I mean, it was supposed to be representative of his current health, but... Yeah, you're uh, right. Like, yeah. once that, that, um, that relationship was established, that's when, like, they perked right up. And then you slowly saw them die over time and then finally died, died, and then came back. But I don't get I it it's just rule of cool. Just I don't think there is an explanation for it. Also this health bar system. Wait, what? Is this health bar system? <laughs> I mean, technically, yeah, it kind of <laughs> is. Um the the other thing is growing up, I always for some reason thought there was a scene in this movie of E.T. like healing somebody, seeing as we saw like the oh, he brought the flowers back. That I was waiting the entire film for like, oh no, do the agents accidentally shoot like Elliot and he has to bring him back or like, does something happen? Like they get fall down the hill. And I I was like, he heals Elliot at some point, doesn't he? I could have sworn. Yeah, he does. Oh, he he cuts his finger. Oh, that's what it was. It's just the cut on his. Yeah. I don't know why growing up I thought it was he gets a gunshot wound. I mean, that's Mac and me. He might. (laughs) Is it? (laughs) He um Mike gets that stupid head thing that makes it look like he's got an arrow through yeah. his head, and E.T. thinks that. A knife. 
Yeah, it was a knife. Yeah, that was funny. Ouch, ouch. He's like, stop it. I love that they're trying to pawn or pass E.T. off as Gertie for this whole, you know, their whole scheme to get E.T. out into the woods. I like um, how his, their mom doesn't even notice. <laughs> doesn't notice. I mean, she's just so busy with Mexico. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, she was definitely dressed for like, I'm going to hit on some dads that come to the door tonight. She's going to the Halloween party from Hocus Pocus. <laughs> yeah, she was... I feel like Elliot gave her a look like, what are you wearing, Mom? <laughs> it was like a skin-tight, a very revealing cat lady, leopard lady outfit. That one friend from the beginning comes back. <laughs> Shit, where was I going with that? I lost my train of thought. While you find it, I do just want to point out, when he introduces E.T. to Gertie and Mike, and then they like put him into the closet... How big is this closet? Because like they have entire scenes where I, all of them are standing in the closet and there's room. Their closet is my dream. I, I finally realized that it's a shared closet between his oh, and the two um, bedrooms. Yeah, oh, they, it's a shared closet. That makes um, sense. Because there's like there's room where big. they just like have play things in the closet and they have like a bean bag against the one wall. I'm super jealous of it. I he, David, did you notice he had the Star Destroyer playset? Oh, I don't think I did notice that. Although, I mean, yeah. the number of Star Wars figures he had, which, I mean, was a Kenner placement, but like... I don't think it was a Kenner placement, more so than like a nod to George Lucas. Oh, no, it was a Kenner Toys. Oh, it was? Yeah. Did did E.T. signal emotionally that he's a boy? How did he know that he's a boy? I remember that being a question. Why is that a question? Gertie's like, is it a boy or a girl? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Gertie asks. Well, And then he's like, he's a boy. But then she was like, was he, or uh, was it like, did he have clothes when he got here? Yeah. And less of her, like, her implication was, <laughs> so what, did you, like, see him? <laughs> <laughs> did you lift up the alien skirts? Or, was uh, he wearing clothes? jeans when he came down? And you were like, oh, yeah, <laughs> only boys wear jeans. Cut off jorts. <laughs> <laughs> and a chain wallet. I googled... I googled this. Rule thirty four. It seems to this. It seems to this day. No, oh <laughs> nope. Nope. No one wants that. You know it's out there, and we don't need to see that. His neck extends. <laughs> oh, that's not the only thing. <laughs> but I googled this, and nobody. There's no answer, or there's only guesses. But before the whole drunk thing, Mike gets to school, or they're at the bus stop, or something. Elliot, they all get to school. This is after E.T. is revealed, and his friends are, like, teasing him about it. Uh, Mike's friends are teasing Elliot oh, about it. the insult? And, yeah, he says, Sintus Supremus. Yeah, I looked that up, too. And uh, nobody knows what that means. And you're such a Sintus Supremus. Zero charisma. Sintus Supremus. Zero charisma. Sintus Supremus. Shut up, Greg. Sintus Supremus. Zero charisma. You win. Everything led me back to E.T., but I do yeah. like how Elliot's insult was just zero charisma. Shut up, Greg. It's like zero charisma. It's like, all right. <laughs> I put all my points into strength and then just hit him in the head. <laughs> Charisma's my dump stat. I'm going to just call people Sin of Supremus. And then... Until somebody knows it. it did you, you, did, you said you looked it up, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, some people try to explain it, like looking at Latin and, and stuff, but I, it, I feel like you got to ask the writer or Steven Spielberg what the hell that is. It's like I was able to Google it and it, I picked up as it was meaning big nothing in Latin. That's it. Yeah, that's one of the things I saw. But like, I feel like it should be way more definable if, than like having to search in somebody. Yeah, like of, I doubt this kid just happens to know Latin. So I'm assuming yeah. that if this is from something, it would have to be something that a kid would know from its time. I originally thought yeah, it was like, it, oh, is I mean, this like a monster from D&D from like the it's 80s? Gotta, it's got to be like based on Elliot's response of also doing a D&D themed insult. Like I imagine like that is a monster from D&D. That's some a kind. good point. Somebody did posit that in one of those forums that it might be D&D related and that, but still that wasn't definitive. Like unless it's just... Yeah, I, I wasn't know. even sure if they were playing D and D because when right. they were yeah, I didn't in think the beginning, because so he's like, "You'll go after the other kid." Like that's not how D and D works. But I okay. mean, unless they're in combat, maybe. But from mm. the sounds of it, it didn't even look like he was playing at all. 
Yeah, I mean, I the mean, setup it looked, it looked of, like, they had like a board with actual setup. Like miniatures so. and a... I mean, it, it looked like a bastardization of Hero Quest. Yes. Yeah. What a bastard. Decision. <laughs> One thing I thought was weird too was after you know they the the kids introduce ET to them and then it Elliot stayed home from school because he was quote unquote sick. I thought it was kind of funny on how he was using like the the heated light bulb to raise the temperature and I just could only imagine you know the mom looking at it like wow Elliot your temperature's 180 degrees you're definitely staying home. No <laughs> Elliot, TV. You're dead. I thought he was <laughs> I thought he was putting a heating pad on his face. Well, you put the heat pad on his face, but then while he was doing, he was holding the thermometer in front of the lamp. Yeah. Oh, oh, right. I was waiting for him to to get back in his mouth and burn himself. He had to get the warm (laughs) forehead and the fever. Right, right, right. But then also, because he was home for the day, this whole scene of him showing him like all the different toys and then, you know, that's it. It feels like the mom leaves for only 20 minutes and then comes back and then everyone's really home afterward, too. Yeah, because it's like, show off the toys so we can get the Star Wars thing. Then it's he introduces E.T. to Mike and Gertie. And then it feels like she comes in directly after. Unless she was she not going to work? Was she just going out? Well, then again, we don't know what she does for work. Maybe she's like a real estate agent and she's just showing a house in the neighborhood and then coming back. Maybe. It's canon, though. Um, the bad guys the whole time are like honing in on ET. I want to know what kind of technology they've got where they're, they're driving, they're trolling down the street in a van, like, and you're just like picking up conversations from any Using home. The tech from next Dark to. Knight. <laughs> <laughs> they're just listening to like every conversation everywhere and feeding it in through their car. Right. It was like, it was like enemy of the state levels of technology that they were showing in this <laughs> In this movie, and it, I don't you know. know they, it, they, it makes it makes sense for a secret government group for the hiding of like NASA. you know Men in Black, extraterrestrial like they exist and we got to keep it hidden kind of thing. I fully get it, but then at the very end of the movie, where it's just they set up shop in the middle of a fucking suburban neighborhood, and you got like press and people trying to like figure out what's going on and the dis like. Oh yeah, the kid wants to see ET while he's hooked up in the bed and he's dead. Yeah, sure, let the kid go over and you know do that. Like well, I don't. What I was wondering what? is, is it not all one specific agency where there are multiple groups there, and it was more like the scientists and the military? Because yeah, it seemed like you had the people that were there that were more along the lines of, "Hey, we're just excited to see an alien. We've always wanted to see one." We're here to help him. And then the other ones that were like, but don't let him leave. So I don't know if it was just some people were on board. Some people were against it. Yeah. I mean, the whole, the whole treatment of ET was was very open considering like it it didn't quite feel as shadow government-y as I think I originally expected based on like the opening sequences with them in the woods. And if it was a horror movie, they would have. That's true. And instead, we just then have spacemen. But then they, yeah, like they set up shop in the middle of like the cul-de-sac where they're just running government operations. But it it also could have just like to the scale of like tenting a house to bomb it for like, you know, ticks or whatever, ants, whatever you exterminators bomb houses for. Where it's just this big semi-clear bubble and suddenly everyone in this suburban neighborhood knows that there's an alien. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> something going on and the lack yeah, of security the that like story? a preteen boy just gets into the van with the alien and is able to drive off with it yeah that, that i had that as a note like yeah just those two guys leaving the van and he walks right past them through the tube like where are you going kid i, I feel right like to the to the, the precious government property yeah there's there's definite <laughs> signals van. that like the government agency has no idea what's going on. Like, <laughs> they, to capture the alien, they send in men in space, spacesuits, and then immediately they get dressed down to just, like, masks. And then as soon as E.T. is pronounced dead, they just take their masks off, and they're just like, yeah, it's fine, he's dead now. <laughs> I also like, that's not how that works. Well, somebody that even protests that weird to me. when they end up ripping into the, the like, blocked-off area inside mm-hmm. the living room, and then he hears somebody say, like, well, that's a clean environment. 
and it's just we don't care. I think it's just they use the masks as you know somebody taking off their glasses for dramatic effect after the death of ET. <laughs> Oh, there, were already, there were already God. doctors. There were plenty of people without masks already in next to him and shit. So why some people chose to keep their PPE on, uh, I don't know. I just I just loved how many how many as- assumptions there were made like during yeah. the examination oh. and trying to help him. Where it's just like it's like put him on oxygen. Is is that how he breathes? Is that, is yeah, that how like, he gets give me two cc's or whatever it's like do you know how that's going to affect his system is that's going to work start chest start, contractions start C- do you know yeah. where his heart is does he have a heart is that how it works we've the only thing that we've we've clarified is that he has what like six different strands of dna yeah the, yeah yep. that's a and that should tell you a lot like oh we don't know shit about this alien <laughs> and he's a chorus man <laughs> give him a beer <laughs> to be fair though i know it's an ad placement for chorus but like it it looked really refreshing i thought about it i was like oh man what if it's beer? just et's species has like an accelerated system that once he tried chorus he now needs to continue drinking chorus yeah maybe that's he didn't it. die it was just extremely fast <laughs> he et's he could have been allergic <laughs> to chocolate too <laughs> and he had just he finally got him. <laughs> I mean, he kept feeding him chocolate the whole time. So it's the reverse. He metabolizes food very slowly. So you know, <laughs> <laughs> the cores saying you saying the cores looks refreshing. It reminds me of like yeah, it's like how Duff beer is presented on The Simpsons. It like looks as a kid, it was probably problematic because I'm like Duff looks really good. Yeah, <laughs> beer looks great. I can't wait with to the foam drink and Duff. everything. <laughs> Duff's the stuff. But yeah, Coors looked like a a tasty treat. I don't remember. Did did his mom say shit to him after she picked him up? No, no. She just assumed that the school was telling lies that he was couldn't possibly be drunk. Which well, there's a or deleted scene. Yeah, the that, principal's office. Yeah, I didn't watch it, but I saw that that existed. Yeah. Do you know who plays the principal? Frank Welker, M Night Shyamalan, <laughs> Harrison Ford. Wait, really? Oh, really? really? Good old Harry Ford. Yep. Wait, like full faced or like, you know, that's his voice kind of thing. I think full face. I didn't look it up either because it's one of those deleted scenes that depending on where you watch it, it's included in that cut because some people said that like overseas it was included and some of the TV edits included it as well, but not. uh... Well, I mean, other than the Spielberg connection, it's interesting because the writer um, what's her name? Melissa Matheson. Melissa Matheson. It was married to Harrison Ford. Oh. Because they were married until I think like 2004 before Harrison Ford, I think, married Calista Flockhart or something. Oh, he's one of them. That's right. <laughs> oh, God, you're one of them. <laughs> we should do Die Hard. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what was going on because, like I said, first time seeing this, when all of a sudden E.T. starts knocking back cold ones like he's stone cold. E.T. 316 says, I just whipped your ass. And that's the bottom line. Because E.T. said so. And Elliot starts all of a sudden getting that look on his face. I was like, wait a second. Is this like a Corsican brother situation? Yeah, because the first thing... Is when he when he brings him into the house at first, and Elliot's sleepy, and then ET's visibly sleepy. I don't know who's making who sleepy at that point. I guess I guess Elliot bounces off whatever ET is feeling, and not so much vice versa. But then he's startled when he's getting him food and drops the milk on the floor, and he's and Elliot is equally as startled as ET was. Um, oh, that those makes are sense. like these little clues. Yeah, and then I think that the drinking is the next one and it's when all of a sudden elliot's like i don't understand i'm filled with rage against my fellow man (laughs) (laughs) he starts tearing into the kids it was really bizarre because they do have the lead up like he's in the classroom and like et walks into the cabinet and and elliot's just like ow my head (laughs) (laughs) and it's just like how close is this connection but also why and then the end of the movie when the agents descend on the place and E.T. holds a gun to his head and they're like, don't do anything foolish. <laughs> it's just that, that, that like singing, I, I'm, couldn't, I couldn't figure out what the purpose of that was. 
I mean, unless it's just that like his race are deeply empathetic, that it's like he forms this connection where they feel all the feelings of each other. Mm. I guess maybe that explains so they, some of some of why like Elliot became so connected to him so quickly, considering this is just some weird have, like, creature that can't talk or communicate. No, he's supposed to have twenty other creatures near him at all times, and he had to just <laughs> take the full brunt of the connection instead. Or maybe that's a defense mechanism where they immediately bond with one of the other race. This way, it's you can't kill me; you'll kill your own. And then towards the end of the movie, that connection seems to get more and more severe because then we have the whole thing where Elliot is dying because E.T. is dying until E.T. dies and then Elliot becomes fine, which goes to my parasite point a little bit. But yeah, I don't know if Nick, you said something like this, but I wonder if it's like he can only have this connection really with his own species and doing it with Elliot is like the problem. I wonder. I don't know. Don't know. I couldn't figure it out. I thought maybe like it was it was the Mac and Me thing where they just kept feeding him junk food and he was dying because <laughs> he didn't have real food. <laughs> Is or, that how I that mean, goes in that movie? I've never seen Mac and Me. Oh, oh you great. gotta. You gotta. I mean, now, also, I'm wondering, it's kind of like after seeing this, you've gotta see it now. It's like an organ rejection of it didn't take because Elliot's human, like you said. So it yeah. was slowly over time, it's like slowly rejecting and slowly dying. Mm. Yeah. Then it's like you should have severed this connection when you felt this. Maybe maybe ET didn't know. Maybe he's learning it too. But then again, it, they had there you have light light year interstellar travel. So I don't know. I feel like they should have known this already. <laughs> I mean, maybe it is. Maybe ET's a kid, or maybe he's like the equivalent of just a rando, right? Because like if we went to an alien planet, I couldn't describe to someone how a car like works or like how a, a spaceship works. True. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's like there's a um, uh, I can't think of the comedian, but there's a great stand up like bit where they talk about, oh, I'd go back in time and like I'd bring like all of the, the knowledge of technology to wherever I was in time. <laughs> and you just be like he'd walk up. He's like, oh, so we have these things called cell phones and we can call people from long distances. And they're like, well, how does that work? And he's like, I don't, I don't know. Satellites. <laughs> and he's like, well, what's a satellite? He's like, it's a, it's a thing in space. It's like, well, how do you make those? It's like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's not wrong. <laughs> it's no, not wrong. It's a good, I have a general a idea of the grand scheme of things and how they work. That's but like, why yeah. at least an army of darkness, when Ash gets sent back in time, it's like, good thing he has his, was it like chemistry book in the back of the <laughs> trunk? So it's, we can learn how to make gunpowder. <laughs> but, um, Elliot's teacher is super chill for the fact that Elliot is sitting there doodling while he's talking and he walks by and sees him just drawing aliens. And then he walks back and you think that it's going to be like, come to the front of the class. He picks it up, looks at it and then puts it back down on the table and continues talking and just walks away. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) To that point later when he's uh, releasing the frogs, I think he grabs Elliot's arm to like stop him. But then Ellie gets away and releases a frog. And the teacher just stands there and there's no added line. He just doesn't say anything. (laughs) Well, I heard, I didn't know if it was the teacher or somebody that kept saying like, I can handle this. I can handle this. (laughs) Oh, maybe. But it just, it felt like an empty moment where it's like, you don't see the teacher's face, but it's like, wouldn't, shouldn't he be doing or saying something like, I mean, Also, unless he knew this day was going to come eventually when you get to, like, I never dissected frogs in class. We did other stuff, but I don't think that they introduce you to the live frog and then put it in a jar and they're like, now we're going to kill these frogs. (laughs) Well, yeah, because when, so like I I did the frog dissection, but they were already dead and formaldehyde. Oh, yeah. Like. I'm I was sitting watching this and the teacher's explaining it is like, and you'll cut them open and you'll notice they're still beating heart. And I'm just like. The fuck are you doing? I, yeah, I they just lying. So they just dabbed a cotton ball in chloroform and threw yeah, they it were, in. The frogs were going to be fully alive when they cut also, them open. They were going to kill them by dissecting them. <laughs> the dissection was the murder. <laughs> like it's the equivalent of like walking up behind someone, chloroforming them, and then pinning them to and a board and just start them? cutting them open. Maybe that's well, the math. That's the ending that was originally planned. Was <laughs> ET at the end gets one of the agents. 
and then puts them in a jar with a cotton ball. <laughs> How does it feel? Was it also like E.T. was telling Elliot to free them? Was that it? I couldn't quite figure it out. It seemed like he was like all of a sudden having these impulses. <laughs> I mean, free them. also, I think it's just he was drunk. Free the frogs. <laughs> oh, man, that's true. Yeah, I think you could look at it either way that it was just his in the moment feeling and or like they're they're sharing like E.T. can uh, memories, I guess, or like what he's literally seeing. But yeah, also, as long as we're on these like E.T. connection thing. So after they free all the frogs, I lose track of what's going on because E.T. is watching what I think was The Quiet Man with John Wayne on That's TV. That's what that is? Like, very, I knew you would knew that fucking movie. Very like <laughs> short circuit of, oh, it's we have somebody who's from this, not from this world, learning about the world through TV. But then it, they see on TV of him grabbing the woman and spinning her around and then kissing her. And then it cuts to Elliot like, grabbing this girl in class and spinning her around and then he steps on like this bully or whatever to use him as a stool and then kisses the girl no idea if they have any relationship if they know each other what the situation is there also when elliot's running around the room and like free your frogs and he's like getting all the frogs out there's this one the same kid he stands on his back the kid like has a death grip on his jar and he won't (laughs) release it it's like i want to watch this frog die yeah I've been waiting all semester for this moment. (laughs) I could finally do it in a classroom. What does that mean? (laughs) Sanctioned sitting. There's a lot of dead frogs out by the river. That whole situation is just really traumatic for a kid, I feel like, just to watch this animal die and then cut it open and watch its still beating heart just slowly fade. Okay, class, remember, you did this. Get on home. (laughs) Fuck. Either Melissa Matheson never did a dissection in school and just guessed and came up with the most fucked up way to do it. Well, she was homeschooled. <laughs> <laughs> this is how we did it. It's like, Or the 80s were just a real different time. I think the 80s yeah, might have been maybe. a real different time. Maybe. Oh, this is where E.T. also starts to make the, the he gets the idea to phone home and send out a distress call. Oh, yeah. From watching the movie. Right. No, right. from the, no, the, comic. the comic. Oh, right. The comic. It's the picture, which yeah. he's able to, to figure out mm-hmm. and then build a communication array from a <laughs> a reflecting umbrella and a speaking spell. Yeah. Maybe E.T. isn't an idiot. The fact that he just looks at a comic with one picture and just does, okay, yeah, I can probably do that. And then just builds a radar that communicates with his home ship. Can you imagine if he still considered the dumb one of his of his That's species and culture? Say. He's like Maybe still this. able to make a <laughs> like a interplanetary communicator device using like a buzzsaw and a, a speaking box of spell. Scraps. <laughs> <laughs> Et did this in a cornfield with a box of scraps. <laughs> but he's still like the, the town idiot. I mean, maybe that yeah, he's just the dumbest of his race. But he yeah, but he does really like he has no self preservation skills, but has a real real knack for like technology. <laughs> so he's Gen Z. <laughs> he's just like i'm gonna Burn build you, this, Gen Z. this interstellar communicator but also i'm just gonna fall down this hill and lay f- and, and, and half drown in a river <laughs> i think i answered my own question but i was initially wondering because they they tie once they get it all set up they tie it to a tree the thing that activates it it actually go, cycles through the message is just the wind blowing through a tree and that keeps pulling on the, you know, the saw blade to spin and sure. send the message. Why did yeah. they, I was going to say, why do they need that? But then I guess it's for automation so they can keep going like 24-7. I mean, I it, think I just answered that in my head. But. E.T. invented a perpetual motion machine. <laughs> well, sort of, because I mean, if what it, he's lucky that it was windy that night, because what if it just right. never, there was no wind. Then uh, it, I guess California the redwood winds. I guess to my point, they could have just sat there and, I don't know. Sure, but then they didn't leave it, (laughs) so they could have. Yeah, I feel bad, because, yeah, Elliot was even like, E.T., we gotta get back, like, it's getting late, and then it just jump cuts to Elliot waking up under a bush, (laughs) and he starts looking (laughs) sick, and it's like, oh, this was the beginning of the end for Elliot. (laughs) 
I do like that. So when we were talking about them dressing up E.T. as the like the ghost for Halloween so they can get the machine and whatnot out to the forest to kind of try to pull this off. And he ends up walking by a kid in a Yoda costume and they have a quick yeah. moment from there. What if E.T.'s race and Yoda's race were like on site? <laughs> <laughs> and he immediately just starts laying in real fast and they're like i've never That's seen et move that quick he, <laughs> he just points it and his head explodes like scanners <laughs> theoretically he could do this he just like points and he's like owie <laughs> head explodes then he heals it back to normal he's like i can do this all day i love that that close-up that is the trance that E.T. Is like, seems to be required to go into in order to float he and Elliot above the trees on his bike. <laughs> and later, all the kids on the bike, like he's just... His eyes they, roll they back. Cut that, they cut to that extreme close-up, and he just makes a noise. He's like... Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> he's just concentrating like so Like Sideshow hard. Bob. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I thought was funny, too, the night before... <laughs> Was, you know, mom's freaking out because none of the, like, Elliot's not home yet. The entire time, does she have, like, a grudge against the electric company? Because she didn't have the lights on for, like, three days straight. Maybe and they're it just, not doing well because they spend all the money on the lights in the shed. Mexico's expensive. Those are high-powered lights in the shed, too. So they're they're eating up more power than you think. <laughs> I'm still thinking about E.T. on the bike. <laughs> <laughs> Eyes rolled back, speaking in tongues. Come on, E.T. And he just starts flying. I do like when the police like come to the house because Elliot's missing and they're asking the mom questions like, oh, is, is Elliot okay? Is like, has anything traumatic happened? That he might run away. And she's like, well, you know, father and I is recently separated. And then clearly we can tell that Mike is the only one who actually knows what's going on. Yeah. Because he's just like, oh, yeah, mom. And then Gertie, Gertie just looks at the police officer like, yeah, he's in Mexico. <laughs> right. What if we think it's like, oh, because like he's moved to Mexico and it's actually like, no, he ran away with a woman and they're on the lam. Yeah. You can't get him now. Oh, uh, maybe, maybe that's like a thing. Maybe he like, maybe he actually moved to Mexico. Oh, well, that's, and I it's guess not that's just why... like what she's saying because it's a faraway place. There was a very pregnant pause as they say when uh, Elliot's like dad's not you know wish dad was here he's with Sally in Mexico <laughs> yeah and like mom gets a look Mike gets a look and I'm like oh wait yeah yeah I didn't it's know because the, the mistress thing because D Wallace like Mary seems surprised at that and I didn't know if it was a case of she didn't know that the kids that's what they thought or if it was like I didn't know he's in Mexico with another woman I thought he was just like estranged yeah yes that was in my notes too like that whole moment but like mike knows that elliot knows because he yells at him for like bringing that up and upsetting mom yeah so it's there's a lot that's not said but just kind of like you know there's the strife that elliot's dealing with you know the separation of his parents and everything that's like a very like sea level story kind mm -hmm. of throughout this but um I originally, I, I thought it was like, maybe they were telling the kids that he was in Mexico and he's not actually there because he's like, I didn't know they were strange originally. I thought it was like, maybe he's off doing something else. And then I yes. was like, oh, they keep showing Mr. Keys. Are we going to find out when he takes the helmet off that it's going to be like, I'm home, Elliot. <laughs> I've been hunting this <laughs> alien. <laughs> E.T. brought us back together. And he's like, not quite. I'm still with another woman. His dad, yeah. you find out his dad is actually like in the military and he's at Roswell, but like New Mexico, and they just didn't say the yeah. new part. <laughs> Old Mexico. I'm the one who does all the executions on the aliens. <laughs> E.T.'s like, what? St I've got this big glass jar and this cotton ball. Stand back, kids. <laughs> I, um, I don't remember him saying either the first time I watched it years ago that Mr. Keys was visited by E.T. when he was a kid. But that whole interaction seemed kind of, I don't know whether to believe him well, or not. It, he didn't yeah. specifically say he was visited. I thought it was just like, unless it was, I think what he ends up saying is like, I've been waiting for this since I was 10 years old, like you or something, or like 
oh, he came to but, me too. And I didn't know if he meant yeah. literally he came to me or if it was like, oh, I saw a UFO at some point or like, I've always dreamt of this moment. But it, I did like it of humanizing him of, yeah, not all of them are just like evil agents. It's some of these people also grew up just like Elliot of this is something that I've dreamed about. I'm not here to cause a problem. I just want to be a part of this. Yeah, it was a nice moment where it's like, especially after the the home invasion terror that they wreaked yeah. upon them <laughs> of humanizing at least one of them. And like, yeah, they're here to, even though they might have other, you know, yes, they want to study an alien too. They obviously want to keep it alive. And that guy understood that. <laughs> E.T. sees Key's face after he takes the helmet off and all of a sudden his eyes go you. wide. And he's like, you. <laughs> Key's just like, you killed my father. <laughs> you Ouch. shall die a peasant's death <laughs> as Keith yeah, so drops is, a huge cotton ball in the room <laughs> this is where E.T. gets um, like Elliot comes home sick and he tells Mike to go find him and then he finally does and E.T. looks like he's just covered in powdered sugar face down in the middle of a <laughs> little creek <laughs> too much Krispy Kreme I guess so but I don't, I, I just, yeah, I, was, I mentioned it before, but I didn't understand why they both were getting sick. I, I mean, I understand why they both were getting sick, but I didn't understand why the sickness thing was happening to begin with and why E.T. basically yeah. dies here. And Like, I do think, yeah, you don't have to explain how he's telekinetic. You just, yeah, he's telekinetic, great. Yes, they have this connection. But I would maybe like a little something on why et is deteriorating and yeah. if it is just the proxy like we're just we're just theorizing like I, maybe they didn't even know and they just wrote it that way but that would i think that's maybe a little detail that would have been nice to have in the movie because it's a big it's a huge story beat i mean also i wonder if all the stuff on their ship is creating an ecosystem for et and he's been outside yeah. the ship too long or mm. the fact that yeah. it's like we don't know what his diet is all he has eaten has just been like beer Reese's Pieces and like whatever <laughs> Elliot's given to him it could not actually provide any nutritional value to him and the whole thing too is like you know we don't know if he can breathe oxygen just because he's E.T.'s been, been okay. holding his breath since he left the ship yeah. Yeah. <laughs> E.T. phone home E.T. can't breathe <laughs> E.T. gets back on the ship the end of the movie credits is just <laughs> outside of his heart his entire body is just his lung is his, his, his he is one big lung. Yeah. He just breathes nitrogen, but the, uh, the ratio is off. He he actually just breathes like pure carbon monoxide. He's just like <laughs> it's like e Los Angeles, perfect. ET is like hooking a, a pipe to their tailpipe in the car in the garage. It's the only way I can breathe. I know I talked about like the realistic reactions and things and interactions they have in the movie. The one thing I thought felt flat. When the kids that don't, Mike's friends, Tyler, Greg, and I forget the other name, Steve, when they are, you know, they're, they're Mike's ride or die, obviously. Mike, you know, they're, they're stealing E.T. Mike says to them, meet us at the playground, get the bikes. They're like, fuck yeah, we will. Like they, they get on the bikes. Yeah, and they, they like the immediately playground. put masks on and whatnot. And they're like, let's yeah. go. Breaking out machetes. They grab, they grab knives. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they don't know that... I think they... Once they meet up, I, I guess, yeah, they realize it's an alien. But they're... They don't know he's telekinetic. All of a sudden, they're running from the police. It's a dead end. You know, <laughs> there's nowhere to go. E.T. starts levitating them. They're just kind of like... They're cool with oh, it. Oh, tell me when it's over. Like, yeah, they should all the be screaming like on? a Tim Robinson sketch. <laughs> I think it's just funny because it's like they probably were sold because when E.T. wakes up, he's standing on the top of like the little ramp that's there. Like he's Gandalf the White coming back and he's oh, just like that shot. at full power. <laughs> yeah. And then like he does the levitation thing <laughs> and then like you see them pedaling and I'm wondering like do they still have to in order yeah. for it to work? Is or this or like is a just situation like a, they have to believe? 
<laughs> I mean, I would be terrified to stop pedaling regardless. Yeah. Like, I, I better yeah. keep pedaling. I don't know what's doing. Yeah, that's a good point. But regardless, they're just... And then when they land, they sh- they each of them get a close-up of their reaction is just like... Yeah. I, I, it's it, it was just those reactions didn't really sell it for me. Also, if he can do that, why doesn't he just fly himself back to the forest and get to the ship? Right. Why do they have to have that whole... Um, whole posse <laughs> or just the like with the getting all their shit out. oh never mind yeah i don't know it's a good point <laughs> i give up but yeah like before their big escape during the the clean room scene back at the house i do like after keys has the discussion with elliot that they genuinely treat elliot like he's an authority on this right now of we're doing the best that we can like what haven't we thought of yet that you might know of. But I like how he says, you're doing the best that anybody could do. I'm glad he met you first. It really does make Keys immediately likable, regardless. Yeah, and likable. Yeah, Yeah, those were good lines. I feel that's definitely a Spielberg touch. Oh, yeah. And Henry Thomas, just like in this scene especially, I'm surprised this kid wasn't nominated for anything. That is surprising. I did like his reaction to seeing E.T. at like his... His laughs. I don't know if that's if that's directed or if that's just Henry Thomas, like the. You know, it's funny now. That I think about it. Like I can't think of at least in recent memory. Like, has there ever been a child actor who got like an Oscar nomination for best like lead? Uh, and a um, pack win for the piano. Didn't uh, Kirsten Dunst win something for Interview with the Vampire? Supporting, obviously, but didn't she win something? I don't know if she. One, maybe. I just feel like you. A lot of it. It. I mean, it's rare. It seeming at least that a child actor gets like a nod from the academy. When kids are good, it's 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 really surprising and like amazing to me. I know this is a tangent, but the biggest or the most impactful one I can think of recently, or that stuck with me, is I don't know if you've all seen the movie Looper. The kid in that movie, the son, the the one that Bruce Willis is trying to kill, like, I I don't know if he's done more, but like he was at least an amazing child actor. He he looked so young yet seemed so like mature and like being able to act. But yeah, just a. Has, have you guys seen Looper? Once, no. Uh, no, I haven't actually. I googled it. The youngest winner of the Academy Award is Damien Chazelle for La La Land, and he was thirty two years old. For a director, oh, so not no. for an actor. Doesn't matter. It's youngest winners of an Oscar. That's incorrect. <laughs> I think the youngest well, for an Oscar oh, is Tatum O'Neill right, at right, 10. I got it. I, got it. it, I was the, the fucking child Oscar winners and then Wikipedia first <laughs> oh. option. And it brought me to the fucking director one. Sorry, sorry, Jesus. <laughs> Tatum uh, O'Neill. Tatum O'Neill's the youngest person to win an Oscar. Yeah, because I think after Ten Tatum O'Neill, old. it's in a pack one. All right, uh, youngest winner for best actor in a leading role is Adrian Brody at 29 years old and 343 days. Youngest nominee was Jackie Cooper and has held the record for 93 years. He was nine years old for the movie Skippy. (laughs) I remember that. Good old Skippy. So extremely rare for a child actor to get much recognition you think they would never nominate because like you got to put your dues in you're not getting this shit that you know? i mean it could be I mean, that's the thing like you know when when a i feel like child uh, children actors in general like when they're good you're almost just like oh thank god like rather than like being impressed <laughs> yeah because there are there's okay. i mean and of course it makes sense that a lot of them aren't very good they haven't had time to become good there is an interview regarding Carrie Hen's performance in Aliens, and James Cameron said that he interviewed, you know, hundreds of kids for the role of Newt. And his biggest problem with so many of them was that they'd deliver a line and then they would immediately just smile at the camera because that's what they've been taught to do. And, you know, it's the movie is not a smile movie. So she was one of the very few child actors to kind of understand that 
this is some heavy stuff and I shouldn't be smiling through my audition. And that's what ultimately got her the part. Yeah, I think a lot of them may Good be job. more prepared for like sitcom acting of like, and you mug to the camera and laugh. And it's like, not yeah. for everything. Wink, wink. The other thing that I thought was odd is after E.T. dies, which is horrifying. And how did that not traumatize children of oh E.T.'s my cold, dead it corpse did. getting bagged up and then a coffin dropped on him? But one of the other scientists is talking and they're like writing down like everything that was done for him. Of we did this and then CPR provided for X amount of time. And then he says, and catheters from the A-line. And they continue. I'm like, wait, they cast E.T. during all of this happening? How, what? Where? How would they even? No idea. They just, just, uh, there, that sounds good. Well, then I good. think they ran out of lines because he's not like, it's not part of the main scene. He's talking in the background to somebody. And then as the main scene's happening, I hear him say catheters from the A-line again. And I'm like, wait, did he hit the end of what they're just saying in the background as noise? So he just started from the beginning and went through again. <laughs> Ruba, yeah, Ruba, there was, Ruba. There was a ton of techno or medical babble at the end that none of it, none of it made sense. <laughs> Were they, they cathed E.T. twice? <laughs> There's alien piss all over the floor. <laughs> You're doing it wrong. That's not piss, sir. <laughs> um it's like what is it i don't Cor's know light. <laughs> there is a rumor for a long time because it's not confirmed but it was kind of believed that between all the different books and stuff related to et that he's actually like a plant but he's more of a, a highly intelligent a plant. plant yeah hmm. <laughs> he's like orcs from Warhammer 40k we're just a fungus <laughs> <laughs> so it's a really friendly one when E.T. dies, and then they have the scene of him coming back as he, like, starts glowing, and Elliot walks away and then realizes, like, the flowers are back. E.T. must be back. I like how then immediately he's like, you gotta be quiet. And then to hide him, he zips the body bag back up and then closes <laughs> the coffin lid. <laughs> I imagine him suffocating right then and yeah. there. Unless he doesn't breathe air, which we don't know. E.T. was alive. <laughs> I like um, like the little scenes of like Elliot then explaining to Mike on like a side of like he's alive, he's back, and Mike jumps out of excitement and smacks his head against the yeah. ceiling. That I don't yeah, know if that was intentional or if it was just like play it off. <laughs> <laughs> it works. Yeah. Um, but ET dying, yeah, the when they go to defibrillate his heart and they cut to that shot of Gertie and she jumps as they defibrillate and she's crying, I'm like, God damn, that is traumatic and sad like i actually teared up i think when they cut to her and she's like crying i was like oh man it got me and et looks at her he's like you brought this on me gertie <laughs> i got cancer from that wig you put on my head we didn't even talk about that but gertie when gertie dresses him up mike sees him like what is this shit <laughs> <laughs> i loved gertie's costume for him so, the chase. The chase. It is iconic. Every time they got on bikes, I kept thinking like, oh, I, I thought there was at one point, like, yeah, there's a chase sequence, and they're on bikes, and then nobody's there, and they're like, oh, it's much less exciting than I thought. And then it's like, oh, <laughs> now they're going after Mike. And I was like, yeah, but this isn't the scene I'm really thinking. And then finally, when they got back to this, I'm just like, we got kids on bikes. <laughs> Like, it's the chase sequence. This is what I was waiting for. Because I like how he just gets his it's crew the together. Guns. They immediately take off. They have that tube that's trailing behind the van with the other two guys still in it. And then Elliot's, like, pulling the latches off. And they're like, don't pull those latches off. And he's doing it. <laughs> I mean, and then those two guys having the worst day The tube ever. drops. <laughs> but then one of the, like, as they're driving away, there's no subtitle for the scene. But one of the guys, like, lands and gets up just as, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> and they take off into the distance. Yeah. I just, I, I like, they're try, they're in this tube going at least, I mean, at least 40, 45, trying to keep their balance as they're effectively just being dragged along the back. Well, of luckily a the tube seemed like it high. had some sort of a bottom. So it's not like they're uh, yeah. actively like, right. but I'm just waiting for him to take a hard left turn and whip that tube around a pole. <laughs> yeah. It, like, I feel bad because like, one of the guys is standing. I think one of them fell a couple times, which yeah. I can't imagine doesn't hurt. And then, and then finally, like, releases them. And I'm just like, man, these these two guys, like, that kid has no idea what he just put them through. 
(laughs) (laughs) These are government agents. You're going away, Mike. But oh so, yeah, they're all going away a long it, time. Like I, th- it was weird when all of a sudden they like break away and they get with the, the kids on the bikes and whatnot, and they think that they're gone. And one of the friends, or I think it might have been Mike, and he's like, "We made oh, it!" Tyler, and all of a sudden, yeah. as soon as he yeah. says it, all of these cops start on foot, <laughs> swarm from the sides of the frame, start running. He just says, "Oh shit!" <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that was C. Thomas L. Which I was wondering, it's like, wait a second, where did all of these guys sneak up on them? And how did all of them sneak up on them via foot immediately? It's like a flash mob of yeah. scientists. While the other cops ahead of them start aiming shotguns at the kids. Do you mean walkie-talkies? Oh, you're right. Walkie-talkies. Special <laughs> edition barreled listeners. walkie-talkies. I wonder if I would go back and look. Did they point or did they just brandish them? I think they like, just think brandished them. Enough? Yeah. Okay, yeah, because pointing them would be like, holy shit. Last time um, I'm going to mention it again, but then you have like a Mac and me situation going on. <laughs> 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 the greatest ending. Greatest ending. Yeah, Tim, you got to Tim, you gotta watch this. I need to see I that. want to watch that with you digitally somehow. Let's, let's make it happen. I mean, also on a side note, if Mystery Science does do an episode of it and it is spectacular. Yeah, I imagine it is. Um... When everybody lands in the forest and then it's all, you know, the heartfelt goodbyes. Gertie gets a goodbye. Mike gets a goodbye. E.T. tells Gertie to be good. E.T. asks Elliot to come with him. Yeah. Can you imagine if that's how it ended? Elliot's like, deuces, gets he on just and just takes what? off to explore the stars. Go I for it, it, baby. it was weird because in the beginning, or not in the beginning, when when E.T. setting up the, the distress call beacon... You know, Elliot's getting all sad and stuff because it's like, I want to, st- I want you to stay. You know, we can grow old together. And I'm thinking, like, kid, he's, you think he's like your age, but he's probably like 42 or yeah, like even all older. All his friends on the ship probably think it's weird. It's like, why do you have such young friends? Yeah. And it's just, <laughs> okay. You want to keep them around and always be together? All right. And it's like, hey, you want to go on an extraterrestrial adventure with me? I mean, I guess like, that, that's, I, I mean, I, it was nice to offer him. It was nice of E.T. to, to make... I think it was one of those, like... <laughs> what if he didn't expect him to say yes? It was just being polite. Yeah, it's like, you know your friend is busy, but you, like, you got to invite them because they're your friend. But you know they're going to say no. And, like, I understand that they had this, like, telekinetic connection to each other. But, like, how connected can Elliot really be to this creature he just met, cannot communicate with, and... Like has no like it's it it's, it's like being connected to a I, cat you met three days ago. Like, yeah, but I think <laughs> like a really smart cat, the, but still a cat. <laughs> I think the fact that it's it's like if he found a dinosaur, it's like this is a special being that shouldn't be here, and only I know about. You know, it's like my. I think I get it from that perspective. It's like you're a little boy. This is like a fantasy that he's living out, and that probably just. Mm. Made Unless it they mind melded it harder for him. So when they connected, yeah. he like learns all of E.T.'s thoughts and vice versa. The other aliens show up and he warns him. He's like, E.T.'s planning a coup. It's way less about <laughs> E.T. and way more about this kid just wanting to live out this fantasy. Yeah. Of having an alien as a friend. I do like that when like it also evidently this was shot chronologically. So they actually shot this as the final scene. So all of the goodbyes really felt more like goodbyes of right. we've gone through all of, which I think was really effective before E.T. Yeah. <laughs> leaves in a James Bond intro where all of a sudden he's standing there. You have that like circular thing that just closes. <laughs> Bye. We just said, it just had through in like a piece, <laughs> just something modern. That's the closest. It's, and it's not even like his bye. It's just all of a sudden a normal voice. Bye. It's like a Brooklyn <laughs> accent. <laughs> Oh, yo, Elliot, Mike, Gertie, I'm walking here, Mr. Keys. I'm going back to space and shit. Forget about it. Oh. (laughs) And he waves. Yeah. And then they show their dedication to pride as they fly off into the cosmos. I think this ends perfectly. Like with the John Williams score, with everything going, especially after you get like the, the iconic bike sequence. I do like the idea of what they had with the ending with the D&D game and the communicator on the roof, just because I think it would have been nice to see like, oh, this isn't a bittersweet thing of, oh, and 
that was an experience we had, but he's gone forever. At least it ends on the note of, oh, like they still have a connection. Maybe they'll see each other at some point. But it does end at a really good scene here. I'll be right here. He should just had like super fluent. I mean, that is a that is a complete and grammatically correct sentence, but he should have just been talking just straight up normally by the end. Elliot, listen to me. <laughs> real talk, <laughs> real quick. I'll be right here. Metaphorically, <laughs> not literally. Gotta go. Or literally, because that is where I planted the parasite in your heart. <laughs> <laughs> we are plant-based. You are my seed. <laughs> Elliot, it's been real, bro. Can't thank you enough for all the Reese's Pieces. But stop calling your mother Mary. It's disrespectful. And she's going through a lot right now. My name is Jeff. Enough of this E.T. bullshit. <laughs> you think my name like, is guys, extraterrestrial? Why would they name me like, seriously, that? guys, what? that's not a name. Your name isn't human. <laughs> Human. <laughs> yeah, that's E.T. And we get the credits. And it's over. I I, I like love this movie. this movie. Yeah, I think it's great. I mean, I don't think that's a bold thing to say, but like... No. For a first-time watch, not having any nostalgia growing up with this, I think it's a terrific movie. Yeah, like I know we're... It's easy to 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 go back and pick apart why they did certain things and plots and yada, yada yada but the feeling like i think for spielberg and probably a lot of people it's like the movies are made for that first i mean they can be rewatched but it's really they're going for that first watch that the whole story like what's the feeling you're getting are and are you laughing are you crying are you experiencing the emotions they want you to and i think this does all that regardless of any of the choices you might be able to pick up heart. And I still get that watching it today. I enjoyed it. I'm glad you liked it, Tim. I'm glad you liked it too. It is good. It's a little weird to me only because of the, like having that childhood connection. The first response to it. Yeah. Yeah. And it it was a little hard to kind of forego that. Cause I mean, I do see a lot of the qualities, but even as an adult, it's a little tougher for me. It's a, it's a harder pill to swallow because it's just it scared the shit out of me as a kid. And they didn't treat millennial children very kindly when it came to a lot of our kid movies. Because, I mean, you know, The Dark Crystal, Labyrinth, you know, Secret of Nim. The, a lot of those movies, yeah, they're meant for kids. But there's some really fucked up scenes in some of those movies where it's like, this is meant for kids, but it's really not at the same time. And with ET's not, it, like, yeah, mm-hmm. no, I'm just I'm agreeing. With you. It's not, it's not, it doesn't come in a wrapper that's bright and colorful. It's very mature. Yeah, and I I see the draw on how Spielberg tried to make this as easy to watch as possible. But as a kid, man, it was it was not easy. I will say. <laughs> yeah i I can't say I, I totally remember like being afraid of it. Like maybe I was. I I think the feeling that I remember is just like not being afraid to the point where like I wouldn't want to watch it, but just being like kind of like the emotions that Elliot is experiencing when he's afraid of ET at first. And David hates it. How does David? Does David um, hates it? <laughs> yeah, this uh, this one still doesn't click with me. Um, I, uh, yeah, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't connect with the main characters or the relationship with E.T. So for me, a lot of the like emotional stuff they tried to go for just didn't hit because I just, I could, I couldn't find that like empathy for the the character situation. I mean, there's, there's things I like about it in terms of it being like an artfully shot film, but you know, I lose that connection with the characters. And then, so the rest of the movie just ends up kind of falling flat for me. So it's, I mean, I guess some of the things that I, I didn't like the movie for originally kind of still held in there. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe just my, my general not liking kids very much. It's just like, the, <laughs> it's like I don't like kids. What are these kids doing? Eh, I don't care. 
Kid's dying. Fuck you, that kid. <laughs> you and Nick, you and Nick, just shaking your fists at clouds. Um, I'm still young at heart, Dean. <laughs> you must love that movie. Um, what's it called? It's got young Phoebe Cates in it. Uh, it's all about being young at heart. Oh God, what's what is it? I think Carrie Fisher's in it too. Shit. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> For a second, I thought you genuinely forgot what movie you were thinking of, and then I was like, "No, this is a bit." I was right there at with my you, expense. It, it clicked. <laughs> Everyone Go stopped listening Dead to Fred, that episode. Everyone. I still think it's at least an eight out of ten ET. Anyway, I mean it's 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 a classic for a reason, and especially with some of the imagery that it does, the not scary stuff. It's it's huge. I mean, like the 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 first time you see the bike you know, flying through the air and it creates that iconic Amblin shot of, you know, with Elliot and E.T. and the bike over the moon, you know, that's, that's so, that's so classic to see. And then when you see all the kids do it at the same time, I mean, it's like watching Stranger Things for the first time in the first season when they're all running away from the cops and then you see the cop heading straight at them in the car and you're expecting them all to start flying in the air, just like an E.T., but it does that you know, 180, like, nope, we're not doing that. We're doing something else. Oh, yeah. Seeing but, this now and thinking back to the first scenes of Stranger Things, it's like, oh, it wasn't just like, oh, we're just making some references. It's like, oh, no, it's like wholesale yeah. pulled from parts heavy, and not like heavy, in, a, heavy, oh, yeah. in a copycat bad way, but just in like, oh, no, definitely it was wearing all its influences on its sleeve. Mm-hmm. Did the cop run them all over? I forget. No, she, <laughs> Eleven flipped them, flipped the car. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> And then the show ended and didn't go for three more seasons. <laughs> a really brutal ending to that uh, that whole thing. It didn't like go um, anywhere. It's just all of a sudden the kids were dead. <laughs> really bold choice. Netflix not just canceling shows, just hard stop ending them. In the show it's, like, it's like, hey, you guys are getting canceled, so we're going to need an episode from you where the entire cast dies. <laughs> <laughs> that's how they should always do it every Sir, single we found time they're going to cancel the show <laughs> we ran over the body but <laughs> we're going to have to cover up some bodies too I want to somehow start my own network and that'll just be the cancellation policy all, right, all, all your characters all have to end. die <laughs> but sir this is a comedy uh, it's just part of the like three- cartoon it's like a three Suddenly camera need to end it. Well, you know, Cupcake and Dino had a good run. Now they're dead. <laughs> <laughs> so that'll wrap up this episode of Screen Refresh. And we can't thank you enough for coming along and revisiting E.T., the extraterrestrial, with us. If you like what you've heard, please drop a review, rating, and subscribe to us on Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. And that'll really help us out. We have social media, but I'll admit we're not always good at pushing ads to keep us in the forefront of your thoughts. You're busy, we're busy, we get it. You can still find us on Instagram at Screen Refresh, and smash that like and subscribe button on YouTube and finding us at the Screen Refresh Network. You can also shoot us an email at screenrefresh at gmail.com or join us on Discord. So you take care of yourself, and you can catch us next on The Rule of Thirds, airing every third Monday of the month. Also, our sister podcast, Don't Open This Podcast, every second and fourth Monday of the month. So for Tim, David, Nick, this is Dean telling you to be good. Man, penis breath was such a hard insult in the movie. (laughs) 